really enjoyed your session. And uh, I'll ask the audience that if they are having any questions, they can ask you in the QA session or in the chat session. Okay. okay. So you and you can answer them by writing their answers. All right. Okay. So thank you so much, Rohit, for being here. Absolutely. <laughs> Have a great day. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter now is Raj Chaudhary, and he's a vice president a Global Services Group of American Express. He's having an experience of 20 plus years, and uh, his focus is on expanding the use of robotics and automation across various processes, uh, supporting B2B and B2C customers, and a keen enthusiast in bringing a digital revolution in servicing world. And Raj focuses on empowering team to drive process optimization and standardization and making hubs uh, digitally ready. So, uh, hi Raj, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, uh, Sarina. Thank you so much for that introduction. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. And uh, uh, we are honored to have you as a keynote speaker. You uh, Please share your screen with us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I you, hope you can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see your yeah. uh, screen now. Perfect. So perfect. Yes, it's perfectly working now. So you can start your presentation. Stage is all yours now. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, firstly, uh, thank you for org org organizing this, Rohit. Uh, good, interesting insights uh, on what happens when you set up a new, new site. And I'm sure I can learn some of that from you uh, since I've been always in a captive operations and you know in my experience but uh, today we'll we'll i think take a page from what rohit had talked about and talked about automation uh, and with uh, you know which is the buzzword today and we'll talk about how do we drive efficiency and automation uh, in an increasingly digitally enabled servicing that our customers experience today so with that you know just very quickly here is here is the agenda that we have the four we talk about in our principles at Amex, what do we do? Uh, the basic thought process, some of the methodology that we use. And lastly, close with an update, uh, like, like a process map of sorts, where we can, where we show how do we go about, you know, transforming that methodology, the thought process into real action on the ground, right? Uh, Sarina did a much better job of introducing myself, so I will skip this page, but, but basically I'm based in Malaysia, um, have a global role, and uh, from a leadership model, it's, it's always, I think, something that I always believe is less of me and more of me, where we think we went together as a team. But let's move on to the core of what we want to talk about today. So before we get to that, American Express, and I'm hoping many of you know who, who we are, but here is our vision, right? Our vision is to provide the world's best customer experience every day. And that vision changes, you know, uh, what the outcome of that vision keeps changing because the customer experience keeps changing from time to time. And as new products, new, new tools come in place, sorry, if you, if you hear some background noise, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, but 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 that's that's you know that's what the Amex vision is about. And and with Amex, the Global Services Group or GSG, we have three principles that we talk about. It's easy, recognize, and solve. So how do we make it easy for our customers? How do we recognize our customers? And then finally, how do we solve our customer requests? Right. That's where it is all about, right? What is a great customer ex experience that it's easy for them to connect with us. We recognize them as the customers they are, but more importantly, we solve their, their requirements, their core needs, right? And that goes into what we put uh, there within our own philosophy of putting the customer first 
in everything that we do, right? Move, we'll move on to the, to the next part of this. So what is the best basic thought process when we talk about digital and we talk about customer experience? And sometimes it may look that it's in parallel or it's in the opposite directions, right? Sometimes we want to become so efficient that we forget the customer in the middle, or sometimes we are so customer focused that we forget efficiency. So how do we get to that, that sweet spot? Now, the first thing is to redefine customer journeys in a technology led world, right? What does the customer experience today? And especially for companies like Amex who are part of the banking sector, which is highly regulated, the world is tougher sometimes. The regulators have a different opinion. The customer has a different opinion. The regulator wants five documents. The customer says, why do I need to give any? So somewhere we'll have to find a way where we bring that together. And that brings to the next point is talk about an universal system. Where do we get a 360 degree view of the customer? How do we know when the customer interacts with us? How many times have they interacted? What have they shared with us? And this sometimes gives unique nuggets when we are talking about customer journeys, because it does help us understand what is the experience that a customer has, not just when they call into the call center, but across any touch point that they have with the organization, right? And then the third point, if you see, talks about defining, right? Who does what with ease, speed and complexity? And what I mean out there with this comment being is to say, traditionally we've seen, okay, the call center is supposed to do this, the back office is supposed to do this, the credit teams are supposed to do something, but having, you know, sometimes it's important to take a step back and say, how can we define, what, what should the call, call center do? Why does the back office do a particular case? Can it be done upfront? Can the call center guy do it? Can we empower them to, to do that work, right? But the underlying point is, can it be done easily? And can it be done quickly? I can empower a frontline rep to do something, but if the frontline rep says, I now spend 15 minutes on the call with this person, that may not be the best way to do it. So I think it's finding that balance is where it is very important. Uh, and then understanding complexity. Sorry, if you're hearing some background noise, my apologies, there's dogs outside in the, in the, in the courtyard having a fight. Um, then there's the complexity which is required. That is the complexity too much that it needs to be handled by a specialized team. And the last line is this, is to communicate, communicate, communicate. And I think with anything that we do, uh, communication is key internally and externally to kind of drive home that message. Why do we do what we do, right? So in conclusion, we need to know how to get it right for our customers, right? And you put the customer in the middle of everything that we're doing, and then that's, that's how we should think about even automation yeah, and even providing digital options for our customers. So within Amex, what we've done is we've kind of divided this in three blocks, right? And uh, we've said that once we take a process, right? And we do some scoring to that process, right? And we've defined that as a simple A1, A2, A3, right? So what is an A1 process? We've, we've, we said, if the process is simple and can be done end to end without any human interaction or any, any human intervention, that is an A1 process. An example of that may be, um, I want to redeem my membership reward points. Now for that, the person should not need to interact with somebody. Our websites, our options should be good enough and the process end to end not just the upfront process on the website, the end-to-end -end process should be automated that it needs no real human intervention to solve for that. So that's like an A1 process that we said, right? What's the A2, what we said is, it has a medium score. And what it does is that it talks about what are the different processes we have, where we may do a little bit upfront, but then the balance processing of that is done 
by by the by uh, the bot. Just just give me one minute, if you guys. I just need to close the window. If you don't mind, please, just give me one second. Um, Pai Rohit, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, sorry, I'm back. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, just one second. There was just too much noise, I think, that you guys were hearing. Yep, okay. So, so, uh, so that was so in the A2, what we said is let's say you have a process where you may you may say that I need a little bit of an intervention, but after that, they everything can be done by the bot, right? Uh, so for an example of that, maybe uh, the customer may put in a request to, to change an address, uh, which is fine, but someone may need to validate whether the right address went in. Uh, and then the whole ch changing of the address on the system is done by the bot, right? So that's like an A2 process. And then we said there's an A3 process uh, where it needs human in the loop. It needs an intervention. It needs, let's say, a decision that needs to be made, which is not a simple yes, no decision, or it needs another another paradigm uh, or another you know, option that needs to be reviewed or a document that needs to be seen or read that's like an A3 automation. So what we so what we kind of did here at Amex was we put almost all of our processes through this lens and said which which process fits where, keeping in mind the custom experience as well. And once you kind of get to that, what you know what happens is I can say okay here is my A1 process, which means. I want this process to be automated end to end without any human intervention. So that's like an A1 process. Okay, next, uh, next one is a, a two. Now we start defining all our processes. For example, in my own team, we've got about 400 case types and we've been able to put all those 400 case types under these various buckets and say, okay, this one should be here, this one should be there, this one should be there, right? And then we slowly start figuring out and prioritizing the rollout of these as per the module where it best fits. So now if you go back to the point I made on the previous page, it's also defining who does what and how, right? And the complexity of it. So a very complex process will fall in A3, a simple standard process will fall in A1. And then you start kind of rolling out the right automation platforms and tools and the tech and the the capabilities that is required for that to happen, right? So what it has done here at Amex is it's kind of put a method to the madness of how do we go about creating a digital footprint for our customers, keeping in mind the customer experience at the same time driving efficiencies through automation. Let's try and convert this now into a real life example, right? So think, think about in this way, in a manual process, you get a request, you create a case, you fulfill it and your case is closed. It's pretty simple straight line. Now, when you want to, to suddenly convert this into a digital journey or an automation journey, this is how it may fall in place, right? A customer can give us a request through multiple channels. It can be through the web, through phone, through email, and even fax. So you will be surprised sometimes customers can still send faxes. Uh, so it's, so the, certainly you see what happens is now there are multiple options for the bot to look at as to where the channel came in, right? And then what you do is you kind of take all these requests and kind of understand is a validation required on that? Do we, does it need additional inputs? Or is this a straightforward case? Um, if if, if it's, it's, a, it's a request digital, if it's yes, it can go for automation integration, right? 
So for example, you can fetch the data, create the case, validate, and just update it because it's a whole end-to-end capability that's come from the web. It's structured data. Everything is fine. But let's say it came from the phone or the email. It's not structured data. So you kind of create the case to create some structure around it and understand uh, what the nature of that request is, right? And then put the lens of RPA into it. So for example, can I leverage RPA with intelligent document review? So today we have capability that can read, you can leverage machine learning uh, or, and then simply you know, um, uh, get that work done. Or again, it's a more simpler of those case types like an A2 automation that I spoke about and just put the bottom into it and close the case end to end. And that just you know, finishes the whole, whole uh, request, right? Uh, in the in the top one where there is document review, does it need a colleague to review something? Does it need another, you know, in, intervention? Um, and therefore, you kind of define that in your process roadmap, and then you fulfill the request. So, in all three ways, you do fulfill the request. But is the it's it's how we get to that end point is what makes the difference. And I think this is where is really how we be, can be successful in having a digital journey that is efficient, but focuses on the customer. Then at the end of the day, for example, let's say, if it's a structured data and I can validate automatically, and if I put a colleague in the loop, then what will happen is I'm not being very efficient because now I am not making the best use of a human resource, which the machine can do, right? So then, then that process may be good from a customer's point of view, but it's definitely not efficient from a shareholder perspective. If you reverse that process and say, I have integrated it end to end. Now the customer feeds in some document. I make the best of what I think it is or the machine makes the best of what it is but we don't have a human intervention, the fulfillment of that request may not be accurate, leading to poor customer experience. So I think this is where those differences start coming in as to how do we create through the Amex vision, the world's best customer experience every day, but we do it efficiently, right? And when we apply this kind of lens, we apply this methodology, you will see that you know, the end outcome will always be more favorable to both parties, which is the shareholder and the customer, right? And that's how I th- you know, we at Amex have been looking at our digital journeys. We, I know we have been improvising a lot. Have we perfected the art? Maybe not. You know, when, you, when you take processes that are legacy, that are done you know, 15, 20 years ago, on platforms that were, that were old, it takes time to change. But change, it definitely does. Today, as we speak, about 20, 25 to 26% of all my work is done digitally, one way or the other. Uh, are we, uh, you know, have we maximized it? Absolutely no. Uh, there's room, room for more, right? Uh, so there is opportunities, there is options for us to do. And I think that's how we will have to continue to drive that. Uh, but, but it does help if, if we go through it in a structured fashion. So bringing it in all together. Automation will help us to enhance control to, uh, and you know, transform the customer experience. Uh, and and uh, it, it, you know it is uh, is cost efficient and is scalable, right? So we all, you know, we, we we know that that our digital platforms are scalable, right? It's efficient, but ensure that we're transforming the customer experience to make it better than where they are today, right? You know, leverage enabling automation by leveraging digital capabilities and the right capabilities, right? I think that's what makes the difference. So it's not about putting the 
you know, the carriage before the horse. It's always ensuring that the right capability goes to the right process at the right platforms. Uh, and, the, uh, and the last thing that I'll say is intelligent automation, machine learning. We're seeing it more and more in our processes. I think there's a, there's a lot more scope out there. There's a lot more opportunities out there for us uh, to leverage that. Machine learning will take some more time because we still get a lot of unstructured data. But I think the day is not far where we can we can be more what 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 we would say within Amex is be high tech, but also be high touch. I think and the sweet spot will be knowing where is where do we need to have high touch, and where do we need to have high tech. Uh, with that. I'll say thank you and, I, and, I, and, and, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, and I wish you a wonderful day, uh, a day ahead. Sabrina, may I give this back to you? Uh, hi Raj, thank you so much for your wonderful session. And uh, it was really a mind blowing presentation. We are delighted for your time and effort you took to hear your expertise with us. Thank and, you so much. Uh, I'll ask the audience that if someone is having any questions uh, from Raj, they can ask in the QA session or in the chat session. And Raj, you can answer their questions by writing their answers. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you have enjoyed Raj's presentation. And now our next presenter is Mahila Kretu, uh, who is a group director, Global Share Services uh, from Puretos. And Mikhaila has a 30 years uh, broad experience in all aspects of financial management and uh, corporate finance, controlling planning, taxes, accounting, and business analysis, along with efficient communications and negotiation skills. So uh, let's welcome Mikhaila. Hi, Mikhaila, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your invitation. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Mikhaila, uh, you can start your presentation yes. by sharing yes. your screen. Yeah, I can see you now. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank I'll you so much share... for being here. Thank you. I will share right away, right away my screen. So uh, let me know if everything is all right. Yeah, I can see it properly. So uh, okay. is that your Fantastic. presentation? Good luck. Stage is all yours now. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for having me uh, in this uh, forum, uh, sharing some experience from um, our company and the project which I lead uh, in our company. It's called Global Shared Service. And uh, what I'm talking about today, it's about global, global process standardization. Uh, well, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it's always uh, easier in theory than in practice. So maybe just a little bit about the company I work for. So it's called Puratos. It's a Belgium company uh, with um, a turnover of two billions. Uh, we have 100 years already experience uh, being an innovative partner uh, in the industry of bakery, patisserie and chocolate. chocolate. So quite a sweet industry uh, we work in. We are present in more uh, than uh, 68 countries, 100 uh, different locations, more than 10,000, almost 11,000 employees by now. And coming to our topic, we have created a global shared service in uh, 2019 after two years of a feed gap um, analysis, what's the most suitable for our organization. Finally, we went live uh, mid-2019. Now, <clears throat> talking about what we have done during those, uh, those uh, two years, two years and a half already, so we have centralized more than 90% of finance processes in all the three towers, P2P, accounts payable, R2A, recording and uh, uh, reporting, and C2C, credit to control, for almost 
60% of entire uh, group, which is quite an achievement, I would say, in uh, two years. This one, it's in a form of a BPO. We have also centralized in-house um, actual costing because that's a strategic process for us. So we decided that we're going to centralize it with an expertized team to execute those tasks. Uh, we have also uh, migrated already in two years a bit into a GBS, Global Business Services, rather than Shared Services, uh, in the sense of expanding the, the subject and the scope uh, within uh, our project GSS. Um, going now, we are going to launch a catalog uh, in procurement. Uh, we are going to, we already launched some help synergies for uh, head, headquarters treasury. So not just finance part, and we are also uh, very advanced on um, starting uh, a POC into um, global payroll, uh, global time and attend attendance uh, software, and so on and so forth. So what is the main strategic objective or, uh, of our GSS project is to help the organization in the areas where we need to perform various activities in a too manual way, too much administration, redundant, repetitive jobs. So this is what we have achieved so far. Uh, I would say quite an intensive journey, but a fantastic journey as well. We have seen huge opportunities for improvement. We have improved a lot, and I'm here to share with you also from our experience some pragmatic uh, uh, areas and maybe helping you with some ideas. Now, before that, I was preparing an, uh, a poll, um, and if it's uh, possible, our colleagues from uh, Platinum to help uh, <clears throat> sharing the poll and the results. Uh, once the results are ready, please let me know. I will stop with the presentation, and we can uh, look on it. So the poll is about... How is it in your organization, this part of um, <clears throat> um, standardization? And I'm curious to find out where do you find yourself in your shared service or in your uh, particular department you or BU you belong to? Where do you find yourself uh, in terms of standardization? It's always interesting to find from other people uh, how far they are on this um, journey. Okay, so uh, should I post your first question, Mihaila? Um, in the form of a poll, if you build the poll, if not, I can continue with the slides. That's okay. Yeah, we can I have, I, we have okay. uh, your yes. it's questions one on the poll. poll. Yes, it's okay, one question. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. okay. Thank you. Wrong. Yes, exactly. So the question is that if we look at our shared services in your companies, how globalized processes uh, are in your case? For instance, are all processes already globally documented, which means globally um, um, standardized? Uh, or maybe you have standardized only the key processes, the critical processes, uh, I would say, or global standardization in your company, it's uh, sporadic. Or the last one, it's like every major site, company, local business in different countries or BUs, they um, have their own documentation. So we do not quite have a global standardization of um, any process. So it would be interesting to, to see your answers um, on, uh, on this. Um, do we have any results already? If you could uh, just um, uh, should I, uh, vote. Should I stop? Okay, shall I stop the poll now? Um, yes, I think it's okay. Okay, okay. It would be so interesting great. to see, and maybe we can refresh. If you can refresh in a couple of minutes, that's okay. If not, we can. Uh, yeah, people already. are just giving their answer right now. So okay. if you want, we can stop it. Or... Uh, yes, we can stop it now. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm sharing the results with you now. Thank you very much. Okay. Interesting. So all processes are documented globally. It's already 40%. It's very interesting. Key processes are documented globally as well. So we see quite a high, uh, let's say, um, uh, coverage of global standardization. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very interesting. Now I'll go further with the, with the presentation. We can close the poll. Thank you very much. Fantastic. 
all rights. Now, continuing with uh, global standardization, we know everyone, as I said already, standardization is great in uh, theory. Of course, we all want to standardize. Uh, when we put it on the paper or on a chart flow, it looks fantastic. We see the efficiencies, we see the improvements, we see the cost efficiency as well. Well, when we go in practice, it's a little bit more complex. So here, I'm here to share with you some uh, um, uh, practicalities, how uh, did we do it and what do we recommend uh, as it was a success for us. So in terms of principles of global standardization in our company, so first of all, uh, what we made sure is that when we created the shared service, the shared service, shared service was fully aligned with the uh, digitalization strategy of the group. Here, the interesting part about shared services is that actually, if we go further also to the GPS, um, the theory says it's kind of auto-destructive model in the sense that in a shared service, the idea is that we have to standardize and automate as much as possible until those jobs are not needed. Of course, in practice, that's not the way it goes in the sense that we take more and more jobs, more and more scope within shared service. Nevertheless, the idea is interesting and talking about strategic approach, uh, indeed, we have to keep in mind the automation like the previous uh, speaker also mentioned about to make sure that uh, any shared service, any global business service is efficient. So what we did in our company, first of all, we aligned the strategy of the GSS with the group strategy and the group strategy digitalization. Of course, like any company today, uh, there is a digitalization strategy that so we aligned together to make sure we go in the same direction. Now, when we talk about the digitalization, I just want to share with you a couple of um, um, aspects which we found them interesting. Usually, we look to a uh, return of investment of digitalization before engaging. However, focusing on the cost saving only can be short-sighted according to our experience. And why is that? It's because let's not underestimate that we also, via digitalization, free up time for the business to be more crea creative and to innovate more in their job rather than execute redundant and manual tasks every day. So we can't put a figure on that, but it's very, very important, which leads to the next, next very important aspect. It's the fact that redundant and repetitive jobs, manual jobs, they do not attract talent man management from the market. So also digitalizing as much as possible the, uh, all the redundant and manual tasks, um, uh, it's very important that we also attract the generation uh, X, uh, Y, Z, uh, or the screen generation as they are called. So that's the, let's say, um, long-term, medium, long-term objective of uh, our shared service. It's to digitalize as much as possible and that to be done in line with our group digitalization uh, strategy. Then, of course, the second step when we go into global standardization, once we do have the objective for us, the second scope, it was how do we communicate? We believe that communication is an extremely important parameter of such a process because it's about change. Um, it's about changing a process and changing the way it's done on the local business, uh, executing it in a different way, um, and this means that we have to get the win-win from the local business and to explain what are the advantages. So what we did, firstly, um, before um, jumping into a standard, into a global standardization, we implemented a communication plan with full support from the executive. So C-suits, it should be fully aligned with you into globalizing processes. Of course, not in very detail and uh, technical details. Nevertheless, <clears throat> presenting the advantages and having the full support for the executives. The second thing we uh, made or in parallel was creating a communication toolkit. So actually we uh, issued several types of documents, communication documents for various stakeholders. Uh, starting from executives, uh, documents for local departments. For instance, if we standardize processes in finance area, obviously we have a certain communication which is more technical towards finance departments. 
Uh, then we had a communication helping them to communicate further, further within the local organization, which is less finance technical, but it explains what will happen in the next month that we will change some of the processes. We had in the toolkit communication documents for the union. Sometimes you need to keep uh, them updated for external stakeholders and so on. So that was extremely helpful because we helped local business in providing uh, a structural communication to entire local team, which respects uh, the strategy and the story of the group. And then we are sure that everybody is in the line um, with, uh, with communication strategy. Then we also looked on the change management. There are standardizations which they involve change management. For instance, if you implement an accounts payable uh, application, like a vendor invoice management, uh, the type of uh, Ariba or other, other type of solutions, this is a change management tool because suddenly people which they do not have even access in the main ERP, they have to get a user and a training and approve invoices, which in the past might have happened directly on the paper or via email. Now they have to have access and training and so on and so forth. That's a change management. And if it's not managed properly, it's create a resistance towards change. So that's also a very important element you have to take into account. Now, in terms of roadmap going on more pragmatic area, uh, how did we do it and how uh, did we really change? Uh, our first step to centralize processes uh, it was to consolidate them into a BPO, namely transferring those processes from local team to a centralized team somewhere in the world executing those processes. So then we uh, transfer, we stabilize, and then we make sure that all those, uh, all those processes are executed perfectly. This is on the principle of lift and shift, and that was the most suitable for our company to make sure that we make it in a smooth way. So that was uh, when we created also Center of Excellence, we uh, followed the same methodology as well. Uh, like that, we have been able to see the full end-to-end -end process. We had visibility. We could capture as well all the compliance parameters and as well business particularities, obviously, which are extremely important. In the, in the same time, we noticed areas which they will be able to be standardized very quickly. We call them low-hanging uh, low fruits. Um, and one general conclusion we have noted from those transfer, it was that our software architecture was uh, not properly used. Uh, there is a tendency of people trusting more uh, Excels rather than the systems because they find quickly the information or for other reasons. So immediately we spot up, uh, spot, up uh, spot areas where we could enable better features uh, in our ERP. Uh, we work in SAP or in other tools like the vendor invoice management, mobile expense, and so on. So that were two important elements from centralizing uh, those processes. Then after centralizing, we of course stabilize. That's, uh, that's the next uh, uh, sub-process step. But the most important part is the second part, it's transforming the processes. Once we centralize them, we have a full, full visibility. We see exactly uh, all the areas where we have pain points. We see exactly where there are big inefficiencies within the end-to-end -end process. So that enable us to come with a transformation program. In our case, transformation program, it's um, based on two pillars. So first one, it's process simplification and standardization. That's very important. And here we apply all the communication and change management parameters because we always have to go back to the local business and to explain if we change a certain process and we execute it in a different way, what are the added values, what are the win-wins, and how are we going to do it? And the second uh, pillar of executing the transformation in our case, it's obviously automation, because that's the ultimate goal uh, nowadays of any shared service or GBS. It's actually once a process is standardized, 
it can be easily automated. So we have already implemented for the standardized processes a lot of um, RPAs, um, robotic process automations, bots. We have web applications. Uh, we have all kinds of features which now they help us to execute much faster a process which has been already standardized. So that's also very important We, uh, in terms of strategy. How do we have it uh, in mind for the next uh, steps? So if we put together process discovery together with implementations, these are elements which helps any uh, shared service or GPS de develop an ideal structure to scale up entire organization. Now, if we go to the process simplification, uh, how did we do it? Maybe more uh, pragmatic approach. So first of all, what we did uh, within our project uh, on GSS, we have taken the control entirely of implementation of um, various applications for that finance area. So if we talk about finance area, which has been centralized, we made sure that we continued the group uh, standardization by deploying uh, applications such as vendor invoice management application, travel and, and entertainment applications, uh, activating uh, SAP features, which is our base uh, ERP. Um, before GSS, it was a certain planning, but sometimes local business, they had different priorities. Within GSS, we made a framework over three years. Uh, we agreed with the countries and with local business when it will be the time framework for them to absorb those implementations, which are extremely important for standardization. We cannot talk about standardizing uh, process uh, invoice processing if we do not have an application, because then they will remain on paper or emails, and then we do not have an automatic uh, approval flow. Uh, we do not have a follow-up uh, in an automatic way, and so on and so forth. So that was one of the first important elements we have done. We have uh, taken the ownership of those deployments to make absolutely sure that we go uh, into global standardization for those processes uh, with a certain speed and considering, as I said earlier, change management uh, as well. Um, I talked already about change management. Um, Examples here are like, for instance, we implement um, uh, no PO, no pay <clears throat> process, which means that if we don't have the number of invoice on a PO, that P, uh, invoice cannot be processed and it will be rejected back to the vendor. This is a big change management um, uh, on a process if we apply that, because of course we have to give time to the vendors, we have to send communications, we have to give some months, we have to give a deadline by uh, by when do we still accept the current process. Uh, we have to, uh, sorry, um, we have to give time to local procurement as well to uh, adopt this style of working. We have to have metrics and uh, KPIs to assure that uh, we do not lose invoices or uh, in this process of change, um, control is still there. So again, change management in some standardization is extremely important and it should be managed carefully and with within time. Uh, we had a holistic assessment as well process, and that's very important because sometimes if you focus on small sub processes, I mean, on the looks yes. Hello. Uh, hi, Mihaila. There is some issue uh, with your voice. We cannot hear you clearly. It's just okay. it just happened right now. Is it okay right now? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. There is some distortion. I think there is some issue. Maybe you need to. I will uh, move uh, the mobile phone. Yeah, it yeah. It's okay now. now. It's okay now. It's okay, perfectly perfect. all right. It was an okay, inter great. interference with my mobile. Thank you for uh, okay. for uh, noting me. So. Um, Coming back to the, thank you very much. So coming back to continuing with pragmatic steps, um, <clears throat> um, the second part it was holistic assessment on end-to-end -end process um, because we noticed that when we look on the sub processes, sometimes we lose the big picture and we might develop standardization just for a small part without seeing 
uh, the entire uh, view of the end-to-end -end process. So this is another learning we have taken from this journey that uh, we always have to look at uh, end-to-end process. Um, and even if there is a standardization to be made for a certain finance, we always have to go back to the uh, beginning of the process where it starts and um, uh, look on the process flow, which are the stakeholders which are going to be involved or impacted and to make sure we involve them in different stages, at least to be aware of. Um, the way we have standardized processes, it's by looking on best practices. Um, there is no solution all fits, uh, solution fits all, because in this case, of course, each business, if it, even if it's the same industry, obviously um, there are business particularities, different channels, different type of customers, different culture, different countries, and so on and so forth. On top of it, it comes the regulatory compliance. Um, so therefore, uh, we had to make sure that those standard solutions are cap capturing all those aspects as well. So best practices are the ones which are tested firstly, then implemented, and obviously we do have to have key measures in place in order to uh, control and make sure that um, everything uh, is, uh, is going as planned and we do not overlook any control. Um, in terms of uh, support provided uh, from our project, um, a big success of this standardization, it was all the involvement from uh, good share services in our company helping local businesses. It was not just an announcement, we're going to change the process, this is going to be as of tomorrow. That's not working. Um, so in our case, that was a big success, the fact that we implemented implemented a lot of parameters and help to local business when we change, when we changed and we uh, standardized uh, one of the processes. So amongst them, I'll give you some examples to inspire yourself. So we created uh, a lot of webinars. We provided a lot of webinars to entire local team um, to make sure that they really understand how are they going to operate with the new software applications or how are they going to uh, work with the new process, what are the requirements from them, what are the deadlines, and when do they go if there are questions. That was very important because we had sometimes organizations of like 500 to 700 SPEs to be informed and to be trained in the new process. If we talk about processes like traveling and entertainment standardization, where they have to use a new app, a new tool, new rules, obviously we have to reach to each single of uh, our colleagues to explain the process and to give chances for questions. So this is what we did, and it uh, it helped a lot as well in uh, implementing uh, softwares like vendor invoice management. As well, uh, we collected all the users. Uh, we um, organized two waves of trainings at the beginning, showing um, um, the process and the tool, and then letting them work for a couple of weeks. And then after two, three weeks, we organized another round of webinar to make sure that uh, they have the chance to pose all the questions, but also for ourselves to understand what are the challenges from their side, and maybe we need to develop some other um, um, documentation or other uh, parameters too. Uh, the second part which helped a lot, we also created a uh, leading documentation online uh, library for the new standardized processes. So besides the webinar, they also have uh, procedures of documentation, which is very dynamic. Every time we learn about a new situation or there are questions, uh, we uh, maybe haven't seen uh, in a Q&A, we updated them in those living documentation. That's also very important. Uh, <clears throat> the new stakeholders are with us during a webinar, but when they work and they perform the task, uh, they are not, they are kind of alone. So it's good for them to have that documentation. It's, it was very important for us and it uh, enabled uh, a significant success uh, keeping close with them. In some cases, we even went into creating short videos, maximum three minutes or one minute, uh, on the principle how to do. Um, when we go into uh, applications for uh, process invoicing, 
there are stakeholders which, for instance, they have to solve in the system situations like uh, different purchase prices, purchase order versus invoice, different quantities, different currency. So those are details uh, and situations which they do not appear all the time. So in this case, we have um, we made sure that they have some videos, uh, some tutorials available. Um, if they have one or two type of situation like this a year, obviously <clears throat> uh, the knowledge might be lost and not that uh, fresh. So they have videos to uh, quickly see uh, which uh, tabs they have to access, which kind of uh, tasks they have to perform. Uh, in that application in order to execute their uh, part of the um, of the task. So that was very important and we received very good feedback. Uh, and we also deployed that. We created only once for the first deployment and then was very easy that every time we uh, went into standardizing the same process in a different uh, location, we have just shared those videos. Uh, which um, are very useful in English, everybody managed, so it uh, was really helpful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the communication framework was also uh, very well received by the local businesses and local teams, wherever we standardize the process, because they also have to manage the communication further on within their own organization. For instance, if they standardize a certain uh, transferable process, uh, in a business in one of our countries, uh, let's call it, uh, for instance, the Philippines, we work mostly with finance and procurement at the beginning. Uh, we settle the chart flow, the process, we explain, then we train all the people, but nevertheless, local finance person and procurement will be the contact person for various questions as well. So this communication framework, it helped always. Also, explaining the story, why do we do it? It's very important to explain the why and to uh, detail for people what are the advantages, what is the win-win, and how do we get to a point where we make the life easier uh, um, from the administration and process perspective uh, for everyone. Uh, we have better control, we have better visibility on cost centers. If the invoices are processed in time, we can pay vendors in time. We have less questions and queries from vendors or from uh, within the organization in respect to various invoices. There are a lot of uh, aspects and added values which is important to be uh, mentioned. This is one of the examples. Um, another important uh, element, of course, are the metrics of adaptability and success in place. It's not just enough to globalize and to standardize uh, one process. Uh, even if we go through all the communication uh, and all the parts uh, of the change management, it's still important to have metrics in place to measure adaptability and to measure to still have uh, all the controls um, audit controls, process controls, efficiency uh, controls, but also adaptability. That's really, really important. And then we can, can go back to the stakeholders and to understand why um, the usage is not complete or why they have stopped in a certain moment along the process. And then we again help with an extra training, extra documentation material, and so on and so forth. So that's something which sometimes it's uh, understated. Um, in terms of uh, concluding, uh, in terms of tips and tricks, I would say uh, the areas which were really, really important uh, and had, uh, helped a lot across the project. Uh, you remember again, in two years, we have been able to deploy uh, the BTO for 60% of the uh, size of the company, um, centralizing 90% of finance. Um, and already uh, advanced on the procurement project, uh, we created a center of excellence for actual costing as well. So uh, we believe that in two years, uh, two years and a half, uh, we achieved a lot. Some tips and tricks from this journey. And again, uh, global standardization is a journey. Um, the end is far away because it's a dynamic environment and there is always something to be further standardized and automated. For us, important, as I said, it was creating the living documents online. Um, it helped uh, our uh, stakeholders and they always came back and uh, appreciated uh, having them available together with uh, the webinars. 
uh, which were recorded and they could always be accessing. And together with the short videos, they were a great success and um, they uh, enable faster adoption of all the standardizations which we performed so far. The second part, it was always explaining the why. Um, it's important to go from the S is um, process mapping. So the S is uh, when we discover the process in place, it's extremely important to make sure that we don't overlook any um, regulatory aspect or business specificity aspect. So the SE's process was very thorough, understanding how today the process is executed and then enabling us to transfer into a standards um, as much as possible without uh, a massive uh, jeopardize of the business or a massive change. So um, that was really, really important uh, going into an, a clear, uh, thorough and uh, accurate as is process before going into a to be. Um, the third one uh, important for us was um, spending enough tra time in training the staff for the new processes. So everyone has to be trained. Uh, we have also training from top to down, uh, even for executives where we have changed application applications, uh, or we have automated more in travel and entertainment. Um, we always aim for a buy-in from the local business of the new processes. We always aim for the win-win, explaining what are the advantages for this standardization, um, showing the automation made uh, in other countries as well. Um, an important element for us was also enabling communication between uh, um, business or BUs or local businesses being already uh, on the standardized process. Uh, enabling uh, meetings between, for instance, finance managers in a country where we centralize the processes, we automate them, and they already have seen the advantages. Uh, we enable this communication between these finance managers and the finance managers in the other uh, local businesses, countries, operations, where we were about to deploy uh, a standardization, automation, centralization. So that was very important as well. They could talk uh, peers in between them, understand the metric, the KPI, the impact of the change, uh, which is uh, a uh, significant change. Um, that was really important for them to, to um, assess whether what is going what is, uh, what is to come. So uh, that, uh, that would be from um, my side in terms of the recommendations. I'm, uh, I was really happy to share with you. I uh, hope you find them uh, uh, pragmatic. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, at your disposal. Or if you can drop later on questions to the organizer, I would be more than happy uh, to share uh, the answers or other details. You can uh, find me as well on the LinkedIn. Uh, I'm more than glad to keep in touch. Uh, hi, Mihaila. Thank you so much Hello. for your perceptive presentation. And Thank you it was for really having wonderful. me here. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor for us to have you as a keynote speaker. And I hope everyone have enjoyed your presentation. And I'll ask the audience that if someone is having any questions, they can ask you in the chat or in the QA session. Okay. And uh, Mihaila, I have some questions for you as well. Uh, how can we manage the changes in this global village? Um, thank you. It's a very good question. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry, Mihaila, uh, but your uh, voice is breaking. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay, now. thank you. Thank you. It's a technology nowadays. Uh, yes, it's a very good question. And we ask uh, all of us ourselves this question probably every day. How do we manage the, the change in such an environment? Um, it's being agile, we know, and it becomes already kind of stereotype. Uh, but that's very important to stay um, up to date uh, with all the developments, being close to the people, uh, to understand what are the challenges. 
um, in this respect, uh, adapting. Um, it's not anymore an environment where we implement, for instance, a process and we think that's going to be a uh, new execution for the next five years. Uh, we have to be ready to change along the way. That's absolutely important to be dynamic and agile and to adapt. It's something which we are not very used with yet. So in the past, we are used on working like six months uh, on the process implementation or process uh, uh, standardization or an ERP implementation, no matter what. We are working for months. We are implementing, we are uh, um, uh, stabilizing. And then we are used that for the next five to 10 years, everything is quite all right here and there, some features, activations, but not much. Well, today we have to be ready adapting along the way because of the environment, because of the business, we see disruptions everywhere. It's not just Corona, uh, we've seen in the even prior Corona, we have disruption because of the weather. Sometimes some industries like ours, uh, sometimes it can be affected. Um, and so on and so forth. So be ready to change along the way. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, thank you. And our next question is uh, how global standardization is effect, uh, affected by the uh, current situation of uh, COVID-19? Um, in my opinion, global standardization is enabled by the COVID. It's, we have a huge opportunity right now to go even faster in standardization because of COVID. I'll give you very unique and simple examples like we have difficulties in some uh, companies to uh, go into higher percentage of invoices to be sent electronically PDF. And I'm not talking yet about e-invoicing, even just simple PDF. We had countries where that was almost impossible to think about two years ago. Now, because of Corona, we accelerated that. Our vendors, they had to move into this way of working because there was nobody in the office or it was only once a week somebody going to the office. If we talk about examples, if we take from Asia examples on payments, where the payments to be made um, uh, via bank transfer, they were involving a lot of papers. That was mandatory. It could have not been uh, bypassed by regulation and so on. This has been changing a lot as well. Suddenly, when two years ago, nobody could have conceived that you can make a pay payment without three, four um, documents printed. Now, today, it's happening even fully electronically. I know that in some regions, this is done by default, but other regions, trust me, were way behind. So um, I use it as a great opportunity, this corona environment, because every time we said uh, we have explanations, we cannot standardize, we are special, uh, this should be done in this way. Actually, we have an extra reason to go into more standardization and digitalization. Because actually that's the step we first standardize and then we can automate. Otherwise it's not cost efficient or effort efficient. So um, in a nutshell for me, it's a huge opportunity Corona environment. Uh, if we look um, uh, thoroughly into uh, taking the advantage of this part, digitalizing as much as possible. It's in our company, we made huge steps, although we were already very advanced into digitalization, but those two years showed us that literally sky is the limit. And we went in so many commercials, web tools and other solutions. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, that's right. And thank you so much. And uh, do you also train the uh, team for providing them webinars? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Uh, do you also train the teams by providing them webinars? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we train the team, the team sorry, via um, various um, uh, leverages, uh, peers. So we have webinars, we have videos, as I said, we record short videos, like max three minutes, not more than that. Uh, we have also made available online documentation, which is stored and it's there. Uh, however, the most important um, actions which they really paid off and enable a success for us, it was the webinars and the videos and the close communication with the team on the why. 
it's very important to explain to our teams why do we do such a change? What will be the win-win? What will be the added value for the entire company and for the local company? It's um, like maybe you know Simon Sinek. He's a while uh, quite famous in this area. Uh, okay, great. So thank you so much. And what are pros and cons of documentation of uh, key processes, uh, but not all processes. Documentation of key processes, I would interpret it uh, in terms of globalization of key processes. Depends on the industry, it's very important. Um, for instance, if you look to uh, um, companies in Japan, if you look to Toyota, for instance, they started global standardization by taking the key processes. They call them critical processes. So they haven't started with absolutely everything. They defined a list of critical processes. And for those ones, they have applied a global standardization. Um, the pros are that there is a standardization which uh, um, governs the risk. So it's very good that we do that. Um, cons uh, depend from industry to industry and what it's left out. If we talk about the yes. finance area, a biggest part of the finance area can be standardized, procurement as well. If we go into marketing, for instance, civilization here depends on the industry. So there, of course, it's better to apply on key processes standardization because that's a bit uh, linked to type of customers in the local business and so on. So um, it's good. But we will never have a 100% uh, total global standardization uh, because, of course, there are regulatories and there are other uh, business uh, parameters. Um, there are pros and cons, and it's a very good approach as well. Maybe the first step before going into a global standardization, we go first for key processes. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Mihaila, for answering the questions. And it was really very informative session. And uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. And thank you thank so you much so for much. being here. And we are looking forward to work again with you. Likewise. And thank you so much for having me. We'll thank you so that. much. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, uh, here we are back after this 15 minute session, uh, after 15 minutes break. And uh, now our presenter is Brian Flores and he's with us. So Brian, uh, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm sorry that um, seems quite dark, but I have a problem today with my apartment. So apologies no, no, for no, that. It's okay. <laughs> No, it's okay. We can clearly see you. So thank you so much for being here as a keynote speaker. And now I'll introduce you. And after that, you can start your presentation. Okay. Good. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, here with us is Brian Flores, uh, who is working as head of record to report and financial accounting at Novartis. And Brian Flores has a 20 years of international experience in finance at Global region and country level and uh, planning operations, controlling taxes, uh, treasury and audit with a background in digital solutions and currently in charge of accounting and reporting uh, for Regent Europe Share Services Center. And uh, Brian, you need to unmute yourself and then after sharing your screen, you can start your presentation. No, thank you. Thank you for, for the introduction and the, and, the, and the welcome that you are giving to me. So let me share my screen and then uh, I will then start the, the presentation. Okay. So, good. Good. So, I will project. Good. So... Let me yes. minimize this, then you can see what I'm doing. And then I will open for questions. I will try to, to, to be very simple and direct to the point because I know that some of you will have some questions or maybe you have some comments as well. So I want to leave some time to, 
to, to respond and to share, right? Because I think that it's good that we are in this forum to share also our experiences or our uh, concerns because who knows the future? I think that after the pandemic started uh, in March 2020, uh, we are pretty sure that the future is, 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 is unknown, right? And more, of course, we can try to make scenarios, we can try to make a, a forecast, etc. But at the end of the day, who knows, right? And then uh, this is something that we can share and maybe we can also learn how the others are dealing with the topic. So the, the topic is um, the 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 resignation, right? In, in the, but it is a topic in the in the U, in the US or or for all the shared service center specifically, right? So let me give you some facts because maybe some of you are quite aware, others maybe not 100%. So let me give you some facts and to give you some context. So let's define what is this about. This is a, a trend, right? That uh, uh, is, is, is in principle in the US. Now in Europe, we also have some uh, parts of it. For, for example, I'm based in Barcelona. We are seeing a, a similar trend here. Uh, I was in the US in November, I mean past month, because I had a, a conference there and um, it's right. Uh, you, you can perceive that the situation is not the best one. For example, in the, in the um, uh, restaurant change, I will not say the brands for obvious reasons, but in, in the restaurant change, you can see in every single place um, an advertising saying that they are looking for employees and the salaries because I, 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 I live in, in Miami in the US uh, some years ago. The salary range are quite um, not that bad, let's put it this way, right? Why? Because um, they need people to work and, 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 and they have this kind of, 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 of behavior now in the, in the US. So we are between finance people. So I know that you don't want and you don't like the blah, blah, blah. You want numbers. Let's go for the numbers. So 11 million in the US, right? Open jobs, uh, they have, or they had in, in July, 2021, right? I mean the year. So, and this impacting at least 4,000 global companies. So there are a lot of people. It was never like this. If you compare the percentage versus the percentage that are working, it has never been like this. So people are really, really concerned about the next uh, steps for this kind of jobs, right? And I will cover what kind of jobs we are talking about. And who are the ones that are resonating? So maybe uh, we can, I don't want to stereotype, but the generation, uh, the millennials, right? The, the people between 30 and 45 years old are the ones that are resonating. And it represents an increase of 20% versus past year. So it's a lot. Even, even that past year, I mean, 2020 was in the middle of the COVID, right? So you can imagine that even though people were concerned and they were very happy to preserve the jobs, in 2021, people are resigning 20% based on this. So in the US, people are really, really concerned, right? So if we see the industries, we are talking about mainly services and, and, and supply chain and production, right? I know that it's not a secret that, for example, in the US, in the, in the Eastern part, they have problems with the ports. People are not working there. And then the, the, the company that are distributing, they have a lot of issues because they cannot distribute. And also here in Europe, for example, we have the the the, the effects because uh, the computers, for example, if you ask now for a computer, you need to wait a bit. If you ask for a car, you can buy the car in November, but you will receive the car in February because there are not too many, right? They are producing according to the to the sales that they are doing, but they are selling in advance. So you can perceive, uh, at least in Europe, for example, in terms of food, we don't have any effect yet, but uh, in terms of supply, especially the tech supplies, we have some effects as well. So it's, it's, it's quite concerned. Uh, what are the reasons behind this resignation, right? What, what are the reasons behind? So we can have a lot. We, we have some official reasons. We have other extra officials, but let's define the one that we think that are, are, are the reasons uh, uh, that are driving this uh, resignation, right? First of all, uh, people are moving to, to remote work, right? And then uh, if uh, a company is, uh, let's say, of lying a person 
to go physically to the office, they are saying, uh -huh, thank you, but no thank you, right? I will prefer to continue working at home. And, uh, and people are aware that the market is, let's put it in this way, hot, right? People are looking for others. For sure, I will get a job, right? And then I prefer to, to, to stay with my kids, stay at home or to do something else. But if you are you oblige me to go to the office, I think that I will not go, right? This is something that uh, is happening a lot. So other reason is that, um, let's be honest, right? After the pandemic, people reflected that uh, we don't have a everlasting life. Uh, you can challenge me saying, yes, Byron, but this is obvious, right? Yes, but in the past, you remember that there were this burnout syndrome, etc., because people work a lot, etc. They want to grow the organization, no matter what or whatever it takes. But now, no, people are saying, uh, you know what? I want to work, but um, I want to, 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 to work for living, not living for work. So if you don't give me uh, this flexibility, or if I am working a lot or in a very tough environment, I will go, right? And this is something that people reflected after the pandemic. And also, let's be honest, right? It, uh, it's sad to say, but uh, year to day, you know that uh, almost five uh, million people already died by, by the COVID, right? And also, I think that uh, as a matter of example, I know that some of, of, of I, I don't know, but I'm sure, that uh, some of us, we have people that die by COVID. So people think, okay, if I will die and maybe will be soon, this is very drastic to say this, but this is what it is. People say, no, I prefer to live my life and work eight hours or less. And I don't want to, to, to work right in, the, in this sense. Another reason behind the grand resignation is that uh, people are very confident that if they leave the jobs, they can get a new one, right? Again, Maybe no with the same salary, maybe no with the same opportunities, but maybe the work is flexible. Maybe the work is something meaningful for them. I mean that they are something, um, they are uh, uh, looking for something that is 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 is, is, a, is a purpose for them, right? Or, or whatever reason. The point is that people say, you know what? The market is hot. The market is. Uh, getting a lot of uh, people, uh, hiring people as well. So I will go, right? I will go because I know as well that the market is recovering from COVID and then the market will not, will never will be the same, right? For sure, never will be the same. Uh, then I will go, I will wait, right? And last, but for sure not least, is that uh, they have government economic support, right? They, you know, uh, for sure, you are working in finance. As a matter of curiosity, you know that the government in Europe, the government in the US, they are giving some uh, uh, salaries, let's put it in this way, or let's put it in this way, support, right, to the people that they don't have a job. And due to the law, it should be until 2023 in some countries and others, uh, it's in the, uh, they don't have limits, etc. So people say, okay, Let's 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 put let's um, be uh, mindful in this sense. If I have a salary that allows me to pay my rent, maybe it's not. I'm not living in the penthouse in a nice building in Miami Beach, but still I have my home, uh, or is, or I can pay my mortgage, right? Um, I can be with my kids what is the point to go out and work and put uh, or to jeopardize my uh, my life uh, with the COVID situation and et cetera? What is the point? And then people prefer to stay at home receiving the government support and then they will not go to work outside the, the their homes, right? This is something that is happening. And now, uh, as, as you are hearing these reasons behind, I want that you relate to the situation that we are living in the shared service centers or in the business um, process uh, that we are outsourcing, right? This is the same. I know that some of you are working with the US, some others are working with Europe, or some others are working for Europe, as is in my case, right? I'm working for Europe. And let me tell you that we are also um, having this experience for the great resignation, right? It's something that is, 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 is there. So 
But let me go into the impact per se, because I think that you are quite interested and quite keen to know, okay, understood, point taken, but what is your point? What is the impact that we could have in the shared service world or environment? First of all, there is a, a survey from McKinsey, you know McKinsey, the consultancy company, and they reported that 40% people are thinking to leave their jobs in the next uh, three or to six months from now, right? Especially next year. I know that the pandemic now has another peak due to the new variants is 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 there, but still people are thinking to go. Again, if you challenge me, say Byron, but this is what it is always. People are trying to change their jobs for another one that is better, no? And the answer is yes, but not in this percentage, right? Because McKinsey made an analysis before and after, and 40% is quite a lot, it's close to the half. So people are saying, I will change my job. I will see what is happening around. And, you know, it's a um, it's a cycle, right? It's a circle as well. Why? Because people know that the market is hot. So the market uh, is uh, lacking people to work. And then people know that they will get a new job. So they resign from the old one and they go to this spiral to get another job so it's quite a circle right people said mm, if you don't like me if i don't like you i will go and i will get a job because i know that there are opportunities for me or i am receiving uh, two, two three calls per day saying that if i want to join that company and then uh, what is the point to stay in this um, in this company right so 40 percent is quite uh, a lot so Another uh, impact for the shared service that we could have or we have, but uh, let's imagine that we could have next year, is um, that the competition for, for talents will be quite bigger than today. But guys, let's be strict and honest. We are shared services. We are not selling, right? We are uh, providing services and we are like um, an expense for the company, right? Of course, they, they, they should do it because if no, we will not exist. But the point is that we are an expense, we are a cost center, we are not a profit center, right? This is obvious. Uh, and then uh, we have the pressure to generate savings because the inflation is there. You know that the inflation across the globe is quite high. In the US, for example, is above 5%. That for them is quite a number. Here in Europe, you have the same number. And sorry to refer to these biggest markets, but you know that the US and Europe represent 75% of the market of the world, right? So if we talk uh, as an example, Europe or the US, we have the entire market of the world a good sample, let's put it this way, right? Having said that, we are in the middle of an inflation. So people want to reduce costs due to this because people don't, don't want to increase the cost even with inflation, right? We are a cost center. We are not a profit center. And then on top of that, we will have or we have a high competition for talent that we had in, in the past, right? This is one important thing, right? Uh, let me give you one example. Let's say that I have a key position in my shared service center, a team leader, a, a manager, or even a, a head or a director, and I need to attract him or attract her. And um, I need to offer, of course, right, all the benefits that we could offer as a matter of purpose, but I need to offer a good salary as well, because, you know, it's quite, quite uh, important. But then... Uh, this person can say, aha, uh -huh, but I want this salary to move because I received a call yesterday from other companies similar to yours, offer me this. Yours is for me most like more attractive, uh, but you know, the salary is important. So if you don't give me this package, I cannot go with you. I will go the other, right? But in our share service mode, we have the pressure to decrease the, the cost and then Guys, what is the point, right? I need to hire people. There are a lot of competition there, but still I have an inflation rate. And you know by experience that if uh, for our customers, internal or external, we at least mention the word cost increase, they will challenge us a lot or they will take measures to maintain at least the shared service cost, right? So this is quite important, um, colleagues. So, 
the other thing that is impacting the shared service, you know, we are all, we typically we are deployed across a, uh, a lot of um, people, right? We have, for example, in our shared service center in Prague, I am working in Prague for Region Europe for Novartis, we have uh, uh, almost 2,000 people. So there are a lot, right? And then we need to create a team spirit. But if we need to be hybrid in terms of flexibility that people can go or not to the office, I know that with the platforms as we are having now, it's possible, but you know that it's never perfect, right? It's better to be face to face. So we want to create in this bigger, in this big team, a team spirit, but in the meantime, people cannot go to the office. It, it has been almost two years. And then we have this dilemma, right? This is other impact for the shared service uh, environment. And last but not least, we can have, a thought, but I selected the most important ones, is that um, people uh, want to work for attractive companies according to the purpose. For example, they want to work in tech companies. I will not mention names due to the, for obvious reason, right? But you know what kind of companies I'm talking about. They want to go there and they don't, they prefer them above our shared service uh, companies. If they at least hear the name of this technological company, we say, I will go, right? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I will go. Or biotechnology, right? You know that biotechnology, for example, in our case, we are producing uh, biotechnology uh, arrangements, very innovative uh, medicines, not the typical pills, etc., right? But, you know, with cell, radioactive, etc., very, very innovative medicine. So they prefer this company versus the others. And then the impact in the shared service centers is that we have less people because they prefer to go even with the same salary or the same conditions, but they will have in their brand the this kind of companies, right? But no all of us are serving these kind of companies, and then we can have shared service impact. Uh, for some, let's be honest, for example, in our case, is good because we can attract people, right? But other uh, companies that you are representing, maybe you have the other challenge, right? They, you are with the risk to, to, to lose people because they will say, mm, uh -huh, but your company is doing X and I want to go for tech because I want to be tech guy. So it, uh, buy. Or, or your company is doing X. Uh -huh, I have the same salary there, but you know, it's this bio, they are doing uh, radioactive medicine, etc., like a superhero, right? that uh, for others is quite a, a challenge, right? So I will close saying because I am almost done with my time uh, and I don't want to use more of your agenda because I know that it's pretty busy. Uh, Byron, but thank you, good analysis, good uh, points, but uh, what can we do, right? What are the points that we can do? Here, you have some advice. This is something that we are trying to do you can uh, select the ones that are applying to you because I know that the realities are different, but uh, um, based on our experience, you can do the following. Uh, and for sure, you can have more uh, suggestions. So first of all, you need to quantify your, your problem, right? Maybe you don't have a problem, you don't have a risk or the other way around. You have a lot of risk and you have a lot of uh, key metrics that will be affected for this resignation. You know that as a shared services, we our main main um, KPI is the stability in the operation, right? We can do whatever we want, we can move the world, but if we are not stable, we are not reporting, we are not dealing with our services in the way that the, the customers want, then we are lose, right? People uh, will not be happy and then we can have consequence due to this. So let's quantify the problem. Do we have a risk or no? right? And this is something that we need to do now. If you are working for the US, maybe I'm not saying that it's quite late, but you need to do another kind of measure because they are already in the problem. In Europe, I think that we are in the middle. In other latitudes, maybe they will start, but you need to quantify the problem and be visible, right, about these kind of topics. The other is uh, identify the root causes. But what are the root causes in your company? Is because your salaries are not that competitive? Is because 
And remember, uh, as we discussed in the first slide, right? Not everything is about money. People now, they know that not everything is about money as we did in the past. We are, especially that we are in finance, we used to think that everything is about money, right? And maybe in the past, 70 or 80% of our people's decision is money. But now, and you can tell me that people take the money as a, as, as a matter of consideration, but will not define the final decision. So identify what is the root cause. Is because the purpose of my company is not that clear. Is because the team spirit is not there. Is because I'm not flexible enough. Is because what are the causes that people want or resign in the past, right? The other thing is you need to, to have retention campaigns, right? Again, as, as we discussed, uh, we are a cost center. So I know that we have a lot of uh, cost measures and pressures to deliver that we don't have a lot of money because we are not selling, right? We are uh, invoicing to a cost center. Uh, but the point is that we can target people saying, okay, maybe I cannot do for everyone or every each of the person that are working for me. I cannot do this, but uh, for this key positions, maybe I will target some retention campaigns, retention bonus, retention uh, retention plans, because again, not everything is about money. For example, I can offer some new positions that are higher in the organization, succession plan, talking with the person, saying, uh, look, if uh, you stay, we will, uh, if uh, these positions are open, you will be the next one, trying to retain our people, right? And don't wait until the person is in front of you saying, I will go. Right, this is quite important. The other thing is assess work-life balance. Um, we are not in the old times when we work a lot and people are willing to work a lot. Maybe in the closing of the month or in the beginning of the month or some peaks, they are willing to do so. But if we are working uh, like a crazy, let's put it this way, then uh, we need to assess this because people can resign in the future, right? Other thing is, offer flexible location options. For example, people now that are based in Spain, they can work for, 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 for other latitudes in, in Europe because in, in Spain, as a matter of example, we have good talents, right? So we can say, okay, you can work uh, from this country to the other. Or for example, uh, you are not obliged to go to the office only one day per week. It will be the day when people will meet together uh, to be a team, right? Could be, but Let's be like this. And last but not least, uh, I think that as a matter of leaders, we need to do it in a in a sense of purpose, right? I think that the, the old style is quite uh, is quite um, it's not useful anymore. Let's put it this way, right? This hierarchical style is not useful anymore. People are not uh, responding to this kind of leadership. We need to lead with a sense of purpose. Why we are doing the things that we are doing? What are the impact that we are creating? And then people will relate to our cause and then we can preserve our people. Again, these are suggestions that you can implement, but long story short, and my, as a summary to open for questions, if any, because we have five minutes to go still. And um, is don't be um, don't be. Oh, let's put it in this way: don't ignore right the situation that is living in the markets, and and don't wait until your share service could be impacted for this phenomenon. Again, as we can read here in the first bullet, if the impact is not applicable to you, fine. If you are protected, of, at least in a reasonable way, because anybody uh, can be protected 100 percent right but if you are protecting a reasonable way great you are prepared you have your plans of course who knows the future but at least you have a plan and then you can uh, anticipate the trends of the market so this is all from my end and i will open now for your questions if any I think that you're on mute. I think that you continue on mute.
Now we can hear you. Uh, no. And your mic looks on mute. Now it's working. Hmm? Can you hear me now? Now, yes. Okay, I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. Actually, uh, I think there is something happened with my headphones. So no I apologize for that. And uh, Veron, thank you so much for your wonderful session. And uh, I have a few questions for you. Tell me. So, okay. Uh, how hybrid work arrangements affect the team? No, this is a, a question that we don't have a, a concrete answer, right? But the point is that, especially in the shared service centers, we need to be at the, at the office, right? Because again, you know, we can have uh, Zoom meetings or other kind of platform meetings, but we need to be together, right, as, as a team, right? So this is something that we need to, to agree. We don't have a perfect answer, but let me tell you what we are doing, and then maybe you can relate to that. For example, we are saying, okay, you have flexible arrangements, you can uh, please ensure your safety, etc. Everything is fine, but at least one day per week, you should go to the office, right? Because we will have the meetings, we will have the the, the interactions, etc. So this is the thing that we are doing now with the, this this new variants. I mean, these new COVID variants, the things are 100% virtual again. But, and people, if they want to go, they can go, but we are not saying that we need to go one day or two days uh, to the office, right? It's up to them due to the situation. But uh, before the situation that we have, yes, it was a plan one day per week to make, to, 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 be, to be a team, right? To be there. And this is the, the recommendation that I have. But um, to answer directly the question, it is impacting the teams, right? Also, people are are, are quite uh, tired, right? To, to go through Zoom meetings every day, every moment. And then we also need to take care of our teams in this sense. But um, this could be a recommendation. Yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful session and for answering my question. And uh, um, it was really very productive session and we are looking forward to work again. Thank you for your time. We are honored to have you. Thank you very much and have a nice one. Enjoy your meeting. <laughs> have a great day. Bye. Bye. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, hope you have enjoyed the presentation of Brian. And it was really very interesting. And now our next presenter is Ketty Muroto. And she is with us. I'll introduce her. Uh, Ketty Muroto is working as a head of business process management, transformation from SRE. Uh, Europe and international and since 2007 leveraging strategic thought leadership and uh, business acumen and process transformation expertise including lean six sigma and other tools and strategies uh, her work is rooted in uh, uh, pragmatism and an execution focused mindset and whether optimizing business models re-engineering and core business processes or connecting the end-to-end -end value chain from commercial to operations uh, leveraging it so uh, let's welcome katie and uh, hi katie can you hear me i can hear you but you turn off my video so i cannot turn it back on <laughs> okay <laughs> someone yeah. needs to turn it for me <laughs> Yeah, actually, awesome. that, uh, at that time, Brian was speaking, so that's why I just switched off your video. <laughs> that's so that fine, could... you kick me out, that's okay. <laughs> I'm so that's sorry good. for that. So. No problem. Okay, so Katie, how are you? 
I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, what good. day it is? Wednesday? It's Wednesday. Yeah, yes. it's Wednesday. <laughs> That's fine. It's good. Almost the end of the week. So all good. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so Katie, thank you so much for being here as a keynote speaker, and it's uh, good to have you here. And we are uh, looking forward to have a very good session and to learn new ideas uh, from your perspective. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Katie, you can uh, start your presentation after sharing your screen. I will. I will. Hi, I was just going to say hi to the guys first. And we are not that many in the call. There's someone called G. Cock. It's like, is it? It feels like it's my my ex boss, Godfrey Cock. <laughs> if it's you, Godfrey. If it's not, that would be interesting. Um, we are not that many, and um, this is 30 minutes. I will share a presentation. And I know Nassim said, let's wait until the end to ask questions, but I want this to be a conversation, guys. So it's okay. If you want, just interrupt me, and um, we will have a great conversation. Um, I want to be really. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, I want to be having a good talk and I want to be telling you exactly what's happening. I want to share with you where we are. Um, so Asahi in general, I'm going to spend a few sell slides, right? Because after all, we do sell beer. We do tons of beers. We sell tons of beer. Um, and this is where uh, we are based in Czech Republic. Um, because if you don't know, this is where... 80% of all the beers being sold, the base of how you do it is actually um, a recipe from Czech Republic back in the 1800s. Um, and so what we do, Asahi is a Japanese company, right? So we've been, we've been bought um, three years ago. Um, and we are, of course, in love markets and on five continents. And we have many production and facilities across. And it's a, it's a quite a small company, right? It's 10,000 people in Europe. Then we have Australia, Japan, and of course the US, but in Europe only it's, it's 10,000. And maybe you know some of those beers, Asahi being one, Pilsner Ukraine, Grosch, another one, Kazan, of course, Peroni. This is kind of our major brands that we have at the moment. Um, so without further ado, what I really want to talk about is <sighs> we have a huge, immense transformation program. And I think most of you are going through a transformation journey. And yes, we will do BPO in the future, but right now, right now, we're trying to think about how we're going to get to this stage of how we're going to do BPO in the future, right? And BPO in our organization also means business process owners. I'm, I'll try not to be confusing. Um, and this journey started um, 11 or 12 months ago, and really it's about harmonizing our processes. So. What we wanted to do, um, and this is where the company's capabilities uh, are, is to have one platform that makes sense, one platform, one way of working, one process, and to simplify as much as we can. And because of the complexity of our landscape, whether it's from a solution perspective or from a process perspective, or if it's actually capabilities perspective, um, we decided to put everything into one bits and starting from top to bottom, right? Looking at sales, marketing, finance, procurement, logistic and planning, uh, manufacturing. So really the entire food chain, this is everything linked together. And what I wanna to talk to you about is what is the rule of process in there and how we did it and how we, we got everything together. Um, and of course, I don't know if you remember the days where we were sitting you know, in a dark room and we would just close our eyes and we'd say, oh, let's imagine what our target processes would look like. And then we would just design those beautiful processes and say, oh, this is nice. And now let's try to find a, an application or a solution that can solve all my requirements in one go. And that never happens, right? Most of the time you have to go and we work and we do things and just in the end, this is not what you wanted. And what we do right now, we're going the other way around. Instead of going with blank eyes and trying to define the future, we actually look for something that already exists that is defining a future. And then we're trying to understand how this is going to fit to what we need. So this different way to just do kind of a fit gap rather than a fit to something is how we do it. Um, and this, I'm going to talk about this a bit later as well. Um, one of the big things that we've seen um, across is, of course, we know there is lots of change. Uh, we know, sorry, I'm going to put this in presentation mode. We know there is lots of change. We know things are coming. We know we need to automate. We need to know have best practices. And 
if my ex-boss would be there with a the kitty, you're always going too fast. You know, we need time. We need, it's a, it's a journey and we need to be patient. Um, and this is true. That's what we know. Um, what we don't know, there are a lot of things we don't know because with this type of, this type of program, when you go from many different ways to just one way or one process on one vision, it's so it's always very difficult to have everything planned and we can't, and we don't want to because things evolve, right? So as much as this is, uh, I would love to work agile, but we cannot work with a program like this. We need to work waterfall. And then within those, you know, end to end that we look at, we do work in an agile way because we have to, but overall the whole program is usually a waterfall piece. So what we need to do and what we will see is the people, what does it mean? How does it impact how we do these things today? What do we need to focus on really? Because when you start redesigning all of your processes for the entire organization, at the end of the day, you need to think about what is, what does make sense to move to the next phase, right? What are we really going to implement? Because if I realize when I do a fit gap, when I understand what the future looks like, that the value is going to be very minimum, then I really don't want to spend a lot of time and energy doing something that is going to bring minimum value. So the first step into everything we're doing is understanding the change, understanding the impact, and understanding the business case that we're going to move forward. Because every change, every move <laughs> is associated with the cost, right? So we want to be very careful around this. Um, then what we've done, this is very difficult. When everybody wants to move and do stuff and let's go and let's do some design, we actually stopped and we say, okay, what is the vision? What do we want to do? What do we want to do as a company, but also what do we want to do per area, right? So of course, the first one that always comes is, yes, we need to have great processes. We need to be scalable, flexible. We need to be doing this easily. We also need to have one way of doing stuff, right? Because right now, and I'm sure you have that already in your own organization, everybody is doing the same thing in a different way, right? So this is not helpful. And even worse, if you have different systems doing that same thing. Um, so right now, this was our objective number one. And of course, we don't do anything just for the sake of doing it, right? Especially we are a business and we sell. So we need to drive uh, profitable revenue growth, not just growth, but revenue growth, right? Not, um, and make sure that this is happening and this is this starts with, our consumer. Um, the second piece is really about people. Um, we know things are going to change. Um, we don't call it operating model, but this is really a change into people competencies. Um, and that also means that they need to be willing to relearn new things. Um, it's important for them, it's important for the organization, it's important for the future, and it's important for them to get on with the change and, and, and start on the right bus. So this is a big deal. Um, if I think about how we've done it right now, uh, so right now we are developing, designing 100% on it for the last two or three months, but we spent the, light, the last eight months preparing for the change, getting the right people on board, making sure that the vision is understood, making sure that the goal of what we are trying to achieve, you know, that simple way of working, the fact that if we have our base right, then we can get the fancy stuff, but we can even get the fancy stuff unless we have our base right um, to make sure that across the different markets that we have, that we use the same technology, that everybody is on the same level. So this was, and still is, the most important piece. The design, the process, the technology, great. If people are not on board, and if we don't change our ways of working um, and competencies, we will not move forward. And of course, at the heart of it all, our, our B2B, our B2C, our consumer, our customer, and our, our men, 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 what we say for Asahi and our bees is we want to have fun and we want to do that in a responsible manner, but also it's about the great taste, right? So this is what, what the vision around the program is. So you see not much about process, but more about people, vision, ways of working. And then how we did it. And this is really what we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, the fact that instead of starting with a blank page, we start with something that is already existing that we can, that we have assessed is the right technology or applications and then go the other way around. And we don't, we don't do that 
enough right now, just because our vendors or our partners are not really equipped to have this ready. So SAP does that very well with their S4 HANA best practices. Salesforce, not so much. Microsoft Dynamics, huh? They have yet to come with what is the best practice for your industry and how you can leverage that to be even more competitive. Because the reason why we have our capabilities, the reason why we follow everything is because we want to be competitive. So here is, a, here is how we do it. And the process and the blueprint is really the starting point. And this is where the transformation starts. And it starts with setting up the right organization, right? So we have in this massive transformation that we have at the moment, there's 350 people. So it's not something small and something that is taking a lot of time and energy from everybody across all different markets. So we have a business process owner that is usually leading a stream, whether it's record to report or source to pay or you know, any commercial piece. Then we have below that person, anybody that is looking at the L2 and more detailed design on this one. And then behind this one person, there's a person in each market. And why are we doing this is because we need to understand what does it mean for the people in the market? How big that change is going to be? Can they actually make it to this, make it this way? Because everybody is starting at a different level, but we all want to get to one level, right? Um, so these people, these market experts are really the key to our success. The BPL, the BPO, yes, they're going to be leading, they facilitate, but the people in the business, the one that are actually doing this on a days in, days out, this is where we are betting on the most because, and they believe me, they are present in all the workshops at the moment because they have to be involved and they will be signing off on the future as well as everybody else. So this is what we are doing at the moment to just accelerate our transformation and not spend the next year and a half to design our to be processes to afterwards think about what the right technology to do so. So here is where we are. The next step is those people we talked about, right? Our SMEs, our business process owners, our lead. The caveat here where I sit is this transformation team where you have business in one hand, the IT in the other hand, which we call hashtag D, um, rebranded. Um, so this transformation team is really sitting in the middle and just making sure that we're still following our capabilities, that we follow our better future vision, and that is all aligned. The other two piece here is change management. And we talked about this through the impact assessment, through uh, understanding where we are, how we're gonna go there and everything that comes with it, right? Training, testing, whatever, anything. Um, and the last one is really our, our partner, who are we gonna be working with that is gonna help us and support us to make that change. Um, and most of the time that partner is different, whether we're doing strategy and business process vision versus implementation. But that's the next step. And I don't know. So I'm still on the first piece. I'll come back <laughs> next year and tell you what happened when we started implementing. Um, and that this is what would change. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I want to focus on the bottom part, right? Which is, yes, this will be more capabilities. And the other piece I haven't touched really is how we get intelligent automation in everything that we do. So every gap that is being identified, there's also a team with us working on intelligent automation, making sure, making sure that this may or may not be solved by something that should be a quick fix and we don't need to wait three years to get something out of it. Um, insight is another big piece about this because, and you all know this, <laughs> um, every company has issues or challenges with data. Uh, we are not Google, we are not an internet company, and basically our data last uh, year, I hear for like the last 200 years, and of course it's a mess, and of course we need to clean, and it's difficult to find priorities to do that and find the right business folks to do it. And we know that we need to get this ready before we, we get on the next stage. But this is very complex, and data in our world is needed to do insights, to do um, trade promotion, to do all those kind of things, this is how, we need to leverage this and our ideas to, to solution our processes. And this is it. Um, when we talk to people, most of the time, they're like, okay, great, awesome. You're gonna harmonize everything. We're gonna have one platform to do it all. 
it should be simpler than if any upgrade is easier. Everybody's going to work in the same manner. We're also going to have more time to do X, Y, Z because reporting is going to be automated because we're going to do this faster, et cetera, et cetera. But what's in it for me? Really, what, what does it mean for me in as an individual in my team and, and in my market, actually, also most of the time? So this is very difficult. This is this like three minutes pitch that you have because yes, we need to do it. Yes, this this is the only way we're gonna save cost and, and stop you know uh, spreading money. But at the same time, it's also about you as an individual how you're gonna make it work and how it's gonna be better for your teams. And most most of them really understand what that means. And you're gonna get better competencies. You can take this you know to the next level. Um, and the next phase of this, once you have it ready, is continuous improvement. How do we make sure that we improve what we have done? How do we make sure that what we have done actually is working? So there's so much more that can be that can be leveraged after we do this. Um, and as a company, um, this is going to bring more consistencies and ways of working. Of course, we want to get our people engaged, right? So. 350 people working on a project out of 10,000, it's not that much, but everybody, all the way down from the warehouse to the salespeople, to the guy doing the spreadsheet in reporting, everybody is going to be impacted because this is not just one stream, this is all coming together. Good, so I'm going to stop now because I want to spend, I know we have 10 minutes left for it, I can, I can do 12 minutes actually. Um, I would like to just have a quick chat with you guys um, because right now this is our journey. This is where we are. Um, but I have many to share and many um, thoughts at the moment and probably gonna ask you also some questions. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can hear you and see you. Okay, so Katie, um, we have a question for you in the chat session. It's from Martin Christensen. Uh, once you have transformed your business, do you know how you will make the assessment for a BPO partner? Sure. Um, so we are very conservative, to be honest. So I, they don't, um, in my XCOM, right? So all the people sitting on the board, they really want to make sure that if we if we do this, we make the right decision for our people. Um, and actually, if you have some ideas, I'm very happy to listen to them because I, I have no clue how we're going to look at it. Um, this feels so far and at the same time so close. Um, and I know we are moving that way. Probably not everything. It's going to have to be conservative bits by bits, show that it works, and and then um, at the end probably move everything there. But Kristen, I guess it's Kristen, right? If you have some ideas, I'm happy to, to take this offline and have a quick chat. Okay, uh, that's great. Thank you so much, Kenny. And I hope that uh, Morton has got your point. So uh, how do you manage the workforce transformation? Very slowly, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Um, and this is um, the transformation in the workforce doesn't come in one day and we need to be careful and we don't want to lose our right people. So. They've been working very hard. They know the business from the back of the hand and we don't want to lose this. What we want to do is use more competencies and also understand what they want to develop in the future, right? So we have a great um, succession planning that is, you know, telling people, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? And we ask everyone if this is an exercise that they want to take forward for the next two or three years. Um, so there's a lot of engagement with our business and our IT folks um, on that level. So this is this is how we manage it. It's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of planning and there's a lot of alignment. And that works. And that takes time. But at the end, you know, nobody is going to go and not be happy. So um, and we don't plan to change the workflows in terms of number. What we plan to do is change it in terms of competencies and capabilities. I can't hear you. You on mute. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No okay, so uh, great. Thank you for answering the question. And one more question. What is the main difference between change and transformation management as far as we know change and transform are the same? 
Oh, this is a very good question. Actually, I never thought about it. It's always it's always felt very different. Um, transformation is really looking at the future, right? How are we gonna make it different? And it's not always a clear answer. We really can't change. We know exactly. We should know exactly what is going to change and prepare for it. Transformation is the journey. The change is the how we're gonna do it. That's the way I see it. Okay, great. Got it. So thank you so much for your uh, wonderful answers and for your wonderful session and uh, i'll ask the audience that if someone is having any question they can ask katie uh, in the chat session or in the qa session and she's here to answer us questions i'm good guys if you have questions that would be great if not i can give you some time back and have a coffee break maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so i think they are not having any questions yet. That's okay, guys. You can reach okay. me, reach out to me, you know, separately if you have questions. Always happy to have a conversation. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Katie, for your wonderful session. And I think we our next presenter is also here. And Good. if you do, you want to add something, Katie? No, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity and. It's not always easy to listen. Um, I was listening to a previous speaker and he was saying that um, we cannot always be all day in the meetings. And this is true. Um, over the last two weeks, um, our CEO came on, on a call and said, we have a new, a new line, is hashtag let it go. So don't go to any meeting that you don't want, you, you're not 100% in, you know, in. And I've been like canceling and declining lots of meetings. So I would advise everyone to do the same and just let it go, right? It's the holidays. So happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy the time off with family. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here and it's really good to have you here as a keynote speaker. It was really an uh, interesting session and uh, the way you uh, conveyed your message. It was really wonderful. Thank you so Thank much you. for being Thank here. Thank you guys. And have a good day. You too. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I uh, hope you have enjoyed the presentation of Katie because it was really very interesting. So now our next presenter is Inka Gran, and she is here with us. So I'll introduce her. Uh, hi, Inka, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. So how are you, Inka? I'm good, thank you very much. Very <laughs> That's good. good. That's great. Okay, so Inka, thank you so much for being here and joining us as a keynote speaker. And uh, it's good to have you here. And I'll introduce you and then you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is Inka Gren and who's working as a finance director at Framery Acoustics. And uh, Inka, lead, Inka is leading a team of finance professionals to next level in global and rapidly growing office uh, fund board market. Uh, her passion is to grow new experts, uh, dwell processes and ways of working with the field of finance. And Inca has a strong experience in finance transformation and business process outsourcing. And she's here with us and it will be uh, an interesting session. So Inca, you can start your presentation after sharing your screen. Let's see, can you... Can you see my my screen now? Yeah, I can see it. Very good. Let's see. Now now it should be visible as as hoped with full screen. Yeah, it's it's the with full screen. So you can start your presentation. Good luck. Stage is all yours now. Thank you so much. So hello everyone. My name is Inka Gran, and as mentioned, I'm finance director for Framery. Um, let's start. What is Framery? Framery is actually making uh, foam booths, pods. And uh, why we are making those is to actually solve noise and privacy problems in offices, uh, different kind of uh, offices and any environment where you need some, some peace and quiet for a moment. And uh, many of our booths can be found from many big players on the global market. So we are globally available everywhere. A few words about my background. So I've been with Framery soon two years now, leading the finance in, in ways of changes 
and growing primary uh, globally. My background is in forestry and paper business. I've been plenty of years in United Paper Mills UPM before joining Framery. And I have long history of outsourcing and shared service experience from that environment, which I'm now bringing into Framery environment. Let's see that. Um, so Framery and what we are talking now about is that Framery is a pretty new company, only 10 years old. But we have reached already the 100 million euro turnover uh, and the global market. We have over 400 years in the global daily operations. And you can find our pods from, from 75 different countries all over the world. We have 20 legal entities and uh, fixed establishments. And uh, we have won quite many design awards already. But then let's focus a little bit on, on the finance transformation over, overall. So let's think about some sports and especially football. And uh, uh, what has changed during 10 to 15 years in football is more than design of the costumes. But some things are the same. The field is the same. We still play with the ball. We still have certain gear. And that is same for any environment that is changing, that some things are the same and some are then changing. And uh, what has come as a new element for football is actually data, uh, artificial intelligence, analytical approach to how players move, how fast, how hard they, they um, do things, how much they run, etc., which has led to a totally different approach in how, pe how those players are trained and how coaches are approaching training overall. And that is the same in any finance team, that how finance operates is very different today than 10 years ago. We have still debit and credit. They haven't changed, which is good. But we have more data, more things done by robots. And overall, leading a finance team has changed quite a lot. And that is the biggest part of the finance transformation at Framery. So leading a finance transformation and leading a team is quite a lot like coaching a team. So any finance team in the same manner as any sports team need to have certain common agreed rules and how we do things. And some of the things we have, what we have agreed on is that we need to play together the same, same game. We have to have the same goal, the same targets. And Framery has a strategy that finance team needs to follow as well. Uh, at the same time, creating an own strategy for the finance. Where, want, where do we want to go? As in any sports, there are some recognized skills that you have to master. And the teams typically have a playbook that they practice. And the same goes for any team that wants to be better. And of course, there are agreed rules that needs to be followed to be the winning team. And as for me, as the leader of the team, it means that the leadership has also changed. You can't do it in the same way. And that is part of the transformation. So how the finance team operates and how it is led and coached. So as a team leader now, for, for today's finance team and how we see forward towards the future, new elements are important, such as data understanding, psycholic, psychological aspects, leadership skills. In my team, we have four different generations presented. Of course, all of the generations have different needs, different things that are important. And therefore, there are always risks for conflicts. So the leader needs to also master conflict management. 
And if compare this list to any list 10, 15 years ago, um, it looks very different. And I would say that this is today's view of the coming few years, how we need to do and, and what are the important things. And after a few years, the list looks different again. But um, as said, I'm repeating myself, but soft skills and playing together are the keys for the transformation. It is not, not only ERP change, data change, automation. It is also how people see things and how they do things that affect. At Framery, there are few very recognized elements of the finance transformation. One is the IT architecture. It affects the daily life of finance, how the IT environment looks like. But we are not in our transformation focusing on changing ERP or doing any major changes in the IT architecture, but minor one, they are daily life, uh, how we develop our tools that we work with, what kind of software we add to the existing architecture. Then there are the yellow uh, part that is business environment and its changes. We are in a rapidly growing environment. And uh, as Framer is only 10 years old, you can just imagine the change of business that has taken place from 1 million to 100 million turnover. And the future will as well include many business environmental changes, global logistics challenges at the moment, uh, pandemic, what has it caused to workplaces and work environment? So world around finance doesn't stay still and it changes. And that affects also how we need to change and transform. Then we have the blue part, which is people with roles and responsibilities. And that is one of the biggest change that we have already done and we continue with is that what are included in different roles and what kind of responsibilities finance actually takes as part of supporting business. Then there are the orange part, which is new requirements. And the new requirements is not only our new requirements, it's also surrounding requirements by tax authorities, local authorities, and especially automation, analytics, and data has brought in new requirements that most of you probably recognize as, uh, as different uh, reporting, uh, electronic reporting things. And the other red block is time. So we faced a situation that the world clock tends to tick faster and faster. Things need to be faster, uh, developed, uh, brought into market, um, on time, everything. But the finance clock has not yet reached the more and more faster ticking world clock. Finance still lives in the quite steady once a month reporting cycle and once a year yearly closing cycle. And playing with this world clock ticking finance monthly cycle is something that we need to also transform and think about that what data and information is needed on a weekly basis and what is enough on a yearly basis. So, what does it take to go into this type of transformation and recognize it and work with the team to move forward? So it is not only a IT or process change that you decide to change something. People need a bit of time to catch up that what is it really that is expected? How do we do this? What does it mean for me? So people is at our change in the focus. It is especially for leaders a balance between patience and implementation speed. So what happens in practice 
as the implementation speed and the patient for patients for the people to catch up and understand what is happening. And um, ways of working are not changed overnight. Um, you can announce it uh, overnight, but it to actually take action and be a daily routine is a different story. And what we have noticed here and also in my previous experience is that the transformation managers are running ahead of the team. So they are way ahead planning different things, what's happening next. And they have been in the middle of planning those changes for a long time compared with any team member. So the team members need to have a bit of time and the managers need to take when discussing with team members steps back and imagine themselves a few months back and hearing about changes for the first time and so forth. And of course, I hope you are all very familiar already with the change curve model. But of course, understanding that each person is in a different place on their own change curves in this type of transformations. Um, so helping them to move forward so that they can see the positive things in, in changes. So our change elements are pretty much around soft skills and how the roles are formed and what finance actually does. Where the basic corners are business understanding, technical accounting skills and IT understanding. So the combination needs to form a triangle that is always more or less closed so that when something happens in business, we have to understand how it affects our accounting and reporting and have a basic understanding of the IT environment. I'm not saying finance persons need to be IT specialists, but they need to have the overall understanding how things work so that they understand whether something gets broken in IT or if something needs to be changed. And of course, a very close cooperation with the IT partner so that this understanding is really created and uh, you can achieve that. So when any key element changes, all of these three corners are affected and the triangle needs to keep its form. So the finance persons need to understand the big picture and act accordingly. So we need to have a re really deep knowledge on technical accounting skills as that's our bread and butter. But then we have to have basic understanding as well of the bis business as well as the IT. And these are the new things that we have started to develop with changes with our roles and responsibilities that finance cannot be uh, somehow alone somewhere and just look at numbers without truly understanding uh, how they relate to business. Um, of course, an aspect is that how does a shared service model and outsourcing fit into all of these changes? Our framery setup is such that we have one global team in Finland. Um, so we have a shared uh, service approach that supports globally all of our legal entities. And we do not have any finance team members anywhere else than, than in one location. To be able to provide good services for the business and support decision making, we have to truly be able to understand also different local requirements, especially related to taxation, payroll and statutory reporting. So therefore, we have one outsourcing partner supporting us in Europe and Asia Pacific area in any payroll local reporting tax questions. So the framery own team is responsible of all reporting and numbers, but we have an outsourcing partner preparing, um, answering questions, supporting. And then we have one outsourcing partner for America's area for the same purpose. The challenging part and 
at the same time, the interesting part is the cooperation with our outsourcing partner from our uh, shared service center. From the perspective that we are expecting from our partners the same as from our own teams. And this has been a new approach for, for some of the outsourcing partners from the, the perspective that uh, we are very much an open discussion uh, house uh, combined with, with a heavy service and development mindset. That this is the same approach that we expect from our outsourcing partners. And that was also one of the selection criteria. And what we have brought in is also design thinking into finance and, and payroll services from the perspective that we do understand who we are working with and what their needs might be. So that we actually put our finance team members into the position of the other party that is involved. And that has been also a new approach uh, for our outsourcing partners that they need to understand a bit the whole environment, why somebody is asking something. So for us, this centralized service center and limited number of, of outsourcing partners fits well, uh, because that way we have harmonized ways of working. We have the same approach everywhere. We have limited number of contact persons and partners for any of our business teams. They know who to contact. Um, and there's not a long list of names here and there. Uh, with limited number of our uh, outsourcing partners, we have clear escalation paths. If something doesn't work or goes wrong, we know how to start solving those. And also based on, on this small number of partners, we have also established good cooperation models with them. And also implemented now centralized billing models, which helps us to manage the costs. Just a short um, view of how we have divided the work then between in-house and outsourced services. So for, for financial controllers, we have in-house own geographical responsibility areas that they take care of from accounting, financial reporting perspective, review and approval of local statutory and tax reporting. And, and uh, our own financial controllers are the main co points of contact towards any frame area. And we have then around financial reporting and taxation outsource the local statutory and tax related matters as well as report preparations and many of the submitting of reports to any any local authorities and of course we see that there is a great value um, of the outsource team especially when we change something whether it's a system or a business model to understand the local needs Around payroll, um, we have in-house uh, the local uh, production entities payroll in Finland. Uh, but otherwise, in payroll, uh, the review, review and approval is in-house, but then the payroll calculation, regulatory change updates, tax-related questions are, are outsourced to our partner. And a similar setup for APAR, so that we managed manage in-house APAR, uh, but then especially VAT, GST related questions, clarifications, um, we have uh, outsourced and in some countries also payment related support. But what does it mean to own team and the outsource team is pretty much that we get this working is the skill set of the future team. And uh, reference to the beginning, um, there's a picture of Finnish football team. Um, and within any sports team, there are different roles. So one is a goalie, one is a fullback, one is a scorer. And we have approached primary finance team transformation in a similar manner that we have selected roles that we want to have. And we have started to fit in 
those within the strategy of the team and the company, and also understanding what is the skill sets needed. And we have, for example, some special skills that we want to enhance in the team uh, related to analytics, treasury, taxes, ERP. And uh, it is now understood within the team that everyone cannot be master of all skills, that we have to have a good balance within the team, that one is specialized in one topic, another one in something else. And not everyone is involved in everything. And uh, the biggest transformation in skills is around soft skills. And here are some examples that we are paying attention to at the moment. So what first one is presentation skills to get attention and ensure that you are understand wherever around framery you go or with any authority. Communication skills that you can change your style depending on the situation. Problem solving, so that we as a finance do not arrive with a problem into a meeting and just state it, but we go into any meeting so that we are, our focus, main focus is to solve any of the challenges that we might bring with us, for example, regulation uh, limitations or anything like that. Interest to learn new things gives us endless opportunities and growth opportunities. Also, courage to share your opinion. All views are needed. It is very important that the different views are shared. Cooperation skills, as well as willing to share the information. So when one learns, everybody learns and, and we can build on that. And one of the biggest challenges for us at the moment is the process understanding how everything is interconnected. If I change something, what happens if somewhere else something changes? What does it mean for finance? And there, there we are uh, having quite a lot of things for next year to improve the situation. Combined with the business understanding, what is truly important to the business? So not only the finance focus, but the whole framery in the view. What have we done uh, during one year um, when we have truly started the finance transformation? We have started with new roles and responsibilities. Clarity to everyone around us who to contact and select who of our finance team members is involved in what so that everyone is not everywhere. Then we have started with different kind of project assignments, selecting a little bit who is joining which development project and ensuring that there is learning and trying new skills. Also enhancing the understanding of business, what truly happens and where, and overall wider understanding of processes around finance. Then we have new tasks and cooperation with business planning and analysis. So in uh, here at Framery, we have a team called Business Planning and Analysis, and we have started to cooperate way more closer with that team to really have a better bridge between uh, business planning and then what comes out as, as numbers at the end of the month. And then as part of the new roles and responsibilities, we updated that job descriptions with larger view than only the technical accounting skills. So we added to our job descriptions quite a lot of soft skills and uh, um, capability requirements so that everyone should have a better understanding of what is expected and, and required. And that has had a positive feedback that it is clearer that what the role really means and and, and what is the target of it. But it doesn't happen without change management and um, driving uh, transformation, even if it's focused on roles and soft skills and not so, so much about an ERP or, or outsourcing as, as such, it still requires top management support. So this is not something you do alone. 
and it requires time so that uh, the manager has time with everyone, one-to-one -one time and team time, both. Repetition of the message and what we want to achieve with a consistent message. And also, of course, the human uh, resources engagement and support for the whole exercise. So alone, no one can achieve any transformation alone. It's always a teamwork and, and uh, also support from top management is needed. So our key to success, we've uh, noticed that it's really courage to do things in a new way and it is based on cooperation. So primary key to success in finance transformation is courage and cooperation heavily those. That was what I wanted to share with you and there is still time for any questions you might have. Okay, so hi Inka, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. And I have a question for you. So I'll ask you, uh, in what ways you have centralized uh, billing models? We have centralized billing models with, with uh, our outsourcing partner so that uh, the outsourcing partner um, internally solves out that which country, what costs, and we as a framery only receive one invoice from one company uh, from this outsourcing partner. So we monthly receive one invoice for all the services globally that, that we have from that outsourcing partner. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Enka. And it was uh, really a very wonderful session. And uh, it was very informative and thank you so much for being a part of this conference and for adding value and i'll ask the audience that if someone is having any question they can ask in kind the qa session or in the chat session okay so thank you so much Inka, thank for you. your session for your time have a great thank day. you happy holidays bye. everyone you too thank you bye 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 Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation of Inka. And now our next presenter is Stephen Marco, and he is with us. Hi, Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Oh. Yeah, okay. I, I was unmuted, that's why, but let me just uh, start my camera. So okay, you sure. Should be able to see me. Okay, yeah. so Stephen, Good. how are you? I'm doing great. That's great. Thanks. Okay, thank, uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we are honored to have you as a keynote speaker. And I'll introduce you and then you can start your presentation after that, okay? Indeed, yes. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here with us is Stefan Marco. He is RTR service delivery lead at CargoTech. And uh, Stefan leads, manages, and organizes the service delivery team globally, including external BPO partners, uh, service delivery. He ensures the process performance of the CBS service delivery in accordance with SLA uh, best practices, internal controls, and KPIs. And Stefan has overall responsibility of service strategy and road mapping and it would be a player to uh, have a um, your knowledgeable session okay thank you okay so Stephen, mm. you can start your presentation after sharing your screen hey, exactly do you see my screen yeah okay, okay great so good luck stage is all yours sam uh, so yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan Markov and it's really great pleasure to be part of such a group of esteemed professionals. Today we will talk about just to see, yeah. Today we will talk about uh, financial reporting and centralized audit. So what CargoTech has done about fastening the um, period and reporting and what we have done in terms of centralized audit. First quick intro, uh, I've been an accountant since I can remember. So I started my career at uh, BNP Paribas 
And after spending around six years there, I had decided to uh, do my master. Usually people opt for another area, but this time I still did uh, accounting. So I had my master in accountancy and uh, control from the University of Amsterdam. Right after that, my journey with the Shared Service Center environment started and I joined Coca-Cola. Uh, shortly after that, I started at Ingram Micro and currently I'm part of uh, Cargotech as hardware service delivery lead. During those years, I've also managed to uh, pass all my ACC exams. So currently I'm an ACC uh, member. And besides my professional life, uh, I can say that I really adore traveling. Unfortunately, due to the current travel uh, development, I'm not really able to travel. So that has been put on hold for a while, but I hope that soon I will be able to resume my, uh, my hobby. Yes, so I've mentioned Cargotech. This is really a quick video of what Cargotech is. So in a nutshell, just sec, yes, in a nutshell, Cargotech deals with smart cargo handling. So we have three main, it's a Nordic company with headquarters in Finland. Uh, so we have three main businesses, Kalmar, Hayep, and McGregor. McGregor shapes the marine industry. Kalmar deals with automated terminal solutions. And Hayab is a leading provider of global on-road load handling equipment. Then moving to CBS, which is Cargo Tech Business Services, the center opened doors back in August 2017 here in Sofia, Bulgaria, covering finance, HR, and indirect uh, procurement. Afterwards, uh, we opened two hubs in uh, states, in the states, and one in uh, Singapore. And also we have like a satellite office in Poland as our main factory is located uh, there. As initially introduced, we also work with uh, financial services, outsourced financial partner. So our, uh, let's say, accounts payable and accounts receivable uh, items are handled by Capgemini out of uh, India. And then moving straight to the topic, uh, we've talked about, we we'll, talk about financial reporting. And when we talk about financial reporting or financial close, the standard, the traditional financial close takes a lot of days. At least this was, this was our case. What was the reason for that? Uh, there were a couple of reasons. Of course, the main one is that information is always received late. Uh, and due to the fact that we received the information uh, late, we have to wait for all the input. Then uh, that leads to additional time, to uh, additional days to close. And also, of course, there were cases where some information was missed. So that's why we didn't have an accrual or uh, what we have in the books was not really accurate. Due to the fact that also the workload is accumulated, uh, it's actually during a couple of days. Uh, that's why there was a high risk of errors. And of course, that leads uh, to bad quality of the financial data. Having all the actuals in the books meant that we, of course, had to wait for that information. And we really spent time on booking every single penny. So we really didn't have any threshold. So that's really not efficient. And of course, all the bookings that could have been done before the close were performed during uh, the month end close. So in general, we have a lot of workloads concentrated in a couple of days, which led really that the art work team was overburdened and that led to additional um, issues afterwards. So this was the standard traditional reporting. 
And once we realized that obviously this is not the right way, what we did, we first assessed our maturity level. And that assessment was based on those six dimensions covering cross and responsibilities, policies, the systems and technology that we, uh, we employ and utilize, uh, how the change management is implemented, and of course, our uh, reporting uh, cycle. So based on these six items, dimensions, we will have a look at that uh, briefly. We determined that CargoTech as a, uh, as a CargoTech Business Service Center was between 2.5 and 3. So if 4 was the, was the best in class level and 0 or 1 was the basic maturity level, we were a little bit above the midpoint, which was not really satisfactory. So knowing what was best in class and where we were at that moment, we identified the gap. And then the next, next question was how to close uh, the gap, that gap. We did that by several initiatives, uh, but before moving to those initiatives, I just wanted to share with you in general what is best in class, because I think that that will be really helpful for all of you. And starting with roles and responsibilities, usually here, I know that it's a cliche, but we really need to have clear roles and responsibilities and how we did that by standard uh, checklist, mountain checklist stating what is the deadline for, let's say, particular input from the business? What is the deadline for us in terms of r to r activities, uh, in terms of uh, deadline for ACP in our case, and also for the consolidated uh, consolidation system? So we really set what information should be sent by whom and by when. And based on those clear roles and responsibilities, we also established our governance model and respectively the SOA. Moving to policy and guidelines, uh, we apply one standard chart of account. So across all CargoTech units, we use one and the same chart of account, which is really helpful uh, because in that case, we can also apply um, the standard policies that are uh, prepared by CargoTech uh, corporate team. So what we have done uh, is that we have translated IFRS standards to fit the cargo tech uh, needs. So for every uh, IFRS standard, we have translation to, uh, let's say, cargo tech business in terms of fixed assets, inventory, and also based on the fact that we have standard processes across all the units, we can easily apply those uh, policies and uh, guidelines. Then for processes and systems, currently we have one system, SAP, and that system is automatically uh, feeding the information to the consolidation system. So we have a lot of automation in SAP and that actually allows us to have really a uh, majority of the transactions automated. The best case scenario is that during month end, we can limit our manual journal entries up to five to 10 per, uh, per reporting unit. And I will discuss also how we have uh, managed that. Uh, technology, uh, technology best in class involves chatbots and artificial intelligence. Uh, in terms of chatbots, we are not there yet, uh, but I just uh, wanted to share that with you because I think that that is really interesting, especially for R2R, maybe due to the nature of uh, the work, it's a bit difficult to implement chatbot, but for some standard processes, it will be really efficient uh, to have those uh, technologies implemented, especially for questions that can be uh, repetitive and uh, standard. And also in terms of technology, currently uh, and also in the future, I can uh, say that uh, the load, the information from ACP to our consolidation system flows automatically. In general, best in class, and also now we're moving to uh, the data reporting and data flows, that load should be entirely automated and there shouldn't be a need for a reconciliation. Currently we do that just to make sure that what our figures in ACP match everything in the consolidation system, but in the future, there shouldn't be a need uh, for that. And last but definitely not least is the, is the change management. You know that every time when we talk about uh, implementation of projects, changes and so on, 
we need support from all impacted parties. If that support is not present, then we are doomed to fail. And here I can say that we had the support uh, from our CFO and all our high level um, finance managers. So they were really our ambassadors in promoting uh, the project of uh, Faster Close. And thanks to their support, we were able uh, to implement it. So what we, act what we actually did, we identified the gap and now starting with the closing process, as I've mentioned, we created that period and checklist. Also, we moved quite, uh, let's say many activities from a close period to the period before uh, the month and close. So for example, payroll. Usually payroll is quite standard every month. If the information is not received on time, we can always make an accrual and we can just adjust the items that we know that they will be, let's say, some additional payments this uh, month or there's some uh, bonus payments and so on. So usually we can identify and we have identified which are those items that are not close dependent and there is no need to wait for the month end to come and then start booking those items. IFRS 16 is also another example. And uh, we also started closing our fixed asset ledger earlier. So we really try to move all those close uh, related or actually non close related uh, activities prior to the week uh, before the period end uh, close. And another significant change for us is to move from actuals to accruals. Because if we wait for every single invoice uh, to make sure that everything will be booked at 100%, then the closing will be done uh, towards the end of next month. So that's why we said, okay, we can make a compromise and we can rely on 95 or 96% accuracy based on accruals instead of and having the data earlier, instead of always waiting for the last, uh, last minute adjustments. Then accruals and journal entries process here, because at the very beginning, we have a significant volume of manual adjustments. But we didn't know the reason for that. So that's why we had a lot of data, but that data was not structured. And we implemented those, let's say, so-called manual journal entry reason codes. And after uh, having that implemented for a couple of months, then we realized that the main contributor for the manual journal adjustment is coming from wrongly posted invoices or the customer orders have been uh, not set properly. So during the month, we did a lot of, uh, and during also period and calls, we did a lot of uh, corrections of the invoices that have been uh, posted. And also um, the customer orders were set with the wrong profit center or the revenue recognition was not set properly. And respectively, we had to uh, adjust that at the month end. So this was the first, the first change that saved a lot of time for us because afterwards we did uh, training to the team that uh, do the coding and also to the sales team that creates uh, the customer orders. So currently I can say that adjustments that we do are quite uh, limited. So that's why I've mentioned that during uh, period 10 calls, we sometimes have up to five uh, manual journal entries. And also we applied materiality threshold. Really, there is no need to make adjustments for five euros during period and calls that can be done later. So uh, we started with uh, 10,000. Of course, that depends on really uh, the volumes of the business, specific, uh, specific of the business and so on. But if we look at consolidated level, at least for cargo tech, 10,000 was really immaterial. Uh, but that would have an impact on the local level, the 40 units. So that's why we started with that amount and gradually we increased the threshold. Of course, uh, for every project, we had to implement some KPIs in government. Uh, so we have determined our KPIs for short, mid and long term and uh, respectively a KPI dashboard so we can track what the progress uh, was. Uh, balance sheet reconciliation was another area. Uh, we had balance sheet reconciliations in place, but actually the content was quite uh, below the expected uh, quality. So what we did is we created one template that showed for every single GEO account, what should be uh, the content of the reconciliation, where that information comes from, 
and who should approve uh, that reconciliation and of course also the rating if it's low medium or high risk because before that every accountant did the reconciliations according to their subjective judgment uh, and we uh, wanted to have really robust reconciliations that can be used uh, for us to apply control over the numbers. And with that standard template, we really increase uh, the quality of uh, the data that we have in the balance sheet reconciliations. And last but not definitely not least, at least for us, uh, in CargoTech, due to its specific structure, uh, we have a lot of intercompany transactions and volumes. Uh, majority of those were quite manual, so luckily ACP provides that functionality that if one invoice is issued uh, in ACP, then if the trading partner, the receiving unit is in the same environment, we can post the quote, the invoice sorry, uh, automatically. So we really eliminated all manual intervention for those invoices. And we also include in those automatic recharges set up in SAP uh, the payroll recharges. Because usually when we talk about some manual recharges, those are payroll and OPEX uh, related. So these were, this, uh, were the four initiatives that we have implemented. So first, we tried to move really what is possible from the week of the month end to the week prior or during the month. And we also encourage the business and also our Artwork team to start analyzing their numbers in advance. Because uh, the practice was that, again, they wait for the month end to come and then, and then they start looking at the numbers. Because it's already too late, uh, it creates additional workload during period and close. So that's why we also uh, shifted that activity to the week prior to the month end. What were the benefits? the benefits sorry of course accelerated close close uh before we used to close the books on the fifth working day now we are able to do that in uh, three days uh also given that we automated majority of our intercompany transactions we moved some accruals prior to the uh period and close week the team now had to focus only on analyzing the extraordinary items so not really looking at items that could have been uh, automated, which was really a wasting of time and there was no really uh, value added to those activities. So that's why the team started analyzing their numbers and they, in that way, uh, they felt really more uh, motivated and they felt more fulfilled of their job. So this was in a nutshell about the fast close. And now if we move to the audit, Audit follow the same uh, the same setup before CBS implementation and before the implementation of that centralized uh, audit setup. Everything was done entirely in the country. So you can imagine that in every country uh, we have more than 150 reporting units. In every country there was a separate audit team uh, which worked together with the local team. So it was entirely decentralized. There was no coordination, of course, no clear roles and responsibilities because no one is actually owning that process. Uh, due to the fact that there was no uh, standard uh, process implemented, uh, in most of the cases, the financial statements were not submitted on time, meaning that uh, we had to pay a lot of additional fees uh, to the tax authorities, also to the auditors and uh, so on, which also imposed some financial risk to the company. So in general, when we talk about traditional audit and the cases where the audit is done entirely in the country, given that there is a shared service center environment, we always face those challenges. So what we did, uh, our new ways of working involved having dedicated team, uh, we call it country finance management team, so that team is, is entirely responsible for the statutory matters and they deal with external uh, auditors, with the tax authorities, and then and they make sure that all the deadlines are kept. Now, having that dedicated team, of course, we had clear roles and responsibilities. What CBS is responsible for, what the business in terms of the financial partnering is responsible for, and also uh, so-called country finance management team. So for every audit, uh, that team organized kickoff calls where we agreed again 
what information we will provide by particular date, will that information come from us, from CBS, or it will be provided by the local business in cases where we didn't have access to that information or the information was sensitive or confidential. And also, instead of waiting for the year end to come and then to start the audit procedure, we identified all those items that can be already provided in advance, which were not really close dependent. For example, um, access to the bank accounts, who can approve the payments. This is a standard procedure for all auditors, and that information can already be provided in advance. Uh, heavily focus on the interim audit. So really, uh, usually the interim audit covers the first three quarters up to September, uh, but we also incorporated October and November, and even in December, uh, we did a lot of testing to make sure that the majority of the transactions will be covered. Uh, but this is specific for CargoTech because our deadline for the group audit is 17th of January, which is really quite tight. And uh, after the year end, we have uh, around five days to finalize the uh, group audit. So that's why, again, we moved as much as possible towards uh, the months before the year end. And something which is really important here is that uh, with CBS having all uh, the countries in our scope, we implement so-called centralized testing. That means that here in Sofia, uh, we work let's, with one team from our auditors and one person, for example, is uh, dedicated to testing inventory or testing fixed, fixed assets. In the past, those auditors in every single country, one auditor had to audit all the different functions. And uh, usually when we do those walkthroughs with the auditors, you can imagine that in every country, we had to explain all the processes to all the auditors. But now having that, information here in uh, our center. Uh, we work with one person for fixed assets. We explain to that person uh, how the process flows, how we acquire fixed assets, how the depreciation goes. And then uh, we provided all information, all fixed asset registers for all units to that person. And it was really efficient uh, because in that case, that person had really thorough uh, understanding of uh, the process and they can easily test uh, all the countries at once. What else? Uh, standard audit list. Uh, similar to bound sheet reconciliations, we did the same list for audit requests, which means that every time a person uh, gets a request for AP or AR subledger or some inventory movements, that person can go to that standard list they can see what is the source of information and what information, the format that we need to use, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to provide to the auditors. In that case, we really decreased uh, the bad quality that we had prior to that implementation because before every single accountant, again, applied some subjective judgment, uh, what input and what information actually output in that case, we need to provide to the auditors. So now having everything standardized, standardized uh, it also saves time for the accountants um, not to look for the sources of that information. RPA was also implemented here and thanks to the centralized audit, again, with the example of fixed asset registers, uh, here, we created a robot that extracted all fixed asset registers for all uh, reporting units in the scope of audit. So in one click, uh, we were able to generate uh, 100 uh, fixed asset uh, registers, and that information was automatically provided to the auditors. The same applied for AP, AR uh, subledgers, and all those standard uh, processes. What else? Uh, yes, visibility. This is related to the fact that working with centralized audit team uh, and their platform, we could easily check all the requests that have been sent to us, what is their status, uh, if some of them have been returned due to uh, missing information or low quality. And afterwards, uh, we can, uh, let's say, update our standard list. So this was uh, our way, way of working with the new setup. So we had centralized team here in Bulgaria, which performed the majority of uh, the items 
for which uh, perform audit for the majority of the items. And in the local uh, audit teams, what is left was related to some tax related uh, topics for which uh, the centralized team didn't have uh, enough understanding. Uh, again, benefits. Uh, after implementing that setup, we were able to submit our financial statement, statements on time uh, due to the fact that we applied common methodology. Common methodology for the timeline, common methodology for the data that we provide, and in general for the ways of working and roles and responsibilities. Uh, after implementing that standard list, of course, we had better quality of the data and uh, all the information that has been provided to the auditors was uh, with uh, good quality. And due to the fact that uh, we didn't, we meet, of course, uh, all the deadlines, we didn't have uh, late penalties, the new process was really more efficient. So again, when we talk about audits, here it will be really good to take advantage of the fact that you have established your shared service centers and you have all the information in one place. And it will be really easy and efficient for the auditors if one person look at all the data uh, for a specific function, in that case, fixed asset inventory or revenue recognition uh, for all the companies that are in your scope. So this was from my side. Back to you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Let me just... Okay, so Stephen, thank you so much for your wonderful session. And uh, I'll request the audience that if someone is having any question, they can ask you in the QA session and in the chat session as well. And I have some questions for you. Uh, how we can maintain continuous accounting in this pandemic? Yes, a continuous accounting is related to the fact that we shouldn't depend on month and close. And what I uh, try to explain at least is really to have all those activities outside of the closing. For example, apply uh, accruals based on not uh, actual data, but based on some estimates. Uh, try to really move that analysis that is usually uh, focused on period and cost outside the period and cost. So first you have to analyze your data. And this is what we did. By implementing those manual journal entry reason codes, we understood what our issues were, why we had really a significant volume of uh, manual adjustments. And by eliminating uh, those reasons, we were able to really achieve that stage where currently majority of the information is already available, regardless if it's month end or not. Okay, great. So thank you. And one more question. How financial uh, risks and additional fees can be uh, deceased in centralized audit? In centralized audit, the first efficiency comes from the fact that you have one team looking at all reporting units. So instead of having different uh, local teams, different uh, local audit teams in the countries, you have currently only one. So I can say that for all those 100 reporting units, uh, the team here, uh, the audit team is around 12 people. Well, in, in the past, in every country, we had around uh, three up to five people. So the first efficiency comes from um, the size of the audit team. The second efficiency comes from the fact that all the financial statements uh, were submitted on time and were signed on time. Because uh, before that centralized setup, uh, we had really significant delays and actually uh, the penalties from the tax authorities uh, were not uh, immaterial. Okay, got it. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for answering my questions and for your uh, very informative session. And we are honored to have you. It's good to have you here as a keynote speaker. And I'll ask the audience that uh, they can contact you in the chat or in the QA session for any questions they have. And thank you so much for being here and adding value in our conference. Thanks a lot for having me and have a nice day. Have a nice day. Happy Bye -bye. holidays. Bye. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, hope you have enjoyed the presentation of Stefan. And uh, now our next presenter will be Benjamin and uh, Sokolovsky. And uh,
he will be with us after 15 minutes and now we will be having a short break uh, for 15 minutes and we will start our present next presentation at 2 30. so uh, you all can grab coffees and something to eat so, and uh, let's catch up at 2 15. sorry 2 30. good luck have fun
Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is your host, Serena, and we are back uh, from the uh, break. And now our presenter is Benjamin Sokolowski, who is the Internal Transformation Specialist at Wintershell DEA. And he will be with us uh, within a few moments, so stay connected. Thank you. Hi, Benjamin. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me too? Yeah, I can hear you. How about you? <laughs> a little bit stressed out now. Yeah, our meeting took a little bit longer, so sorry for being late. Okay, no problem. It's okay. Uh, so, um, okay, so thank you so much for being here and joining us as the keynote speaker. I'll introduce you and then you can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is with us is Benjamin uh, Sokolowski, who is the Internal Transformation Specialist at Wintershell DEA. With an experience of 10 plus years, uh, Benjamin is within the digital transformation team, working on self-service solutions to provide tools to the organization which help to simplify work, optimize processes, and getting more out of the company data. And uh, uh, Benjamin, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we are looking forward to have a great session. You can start your presentation after sharing your screen. Thank you, Serena. Um, so first of all, I will not have a presentation. I will just speak, um, if it's fine for you, because first of sure. all, I have restrictions with, with my Zoom. OK, um, no do it with my private and yeah. So can I start? Yes, good luck, stage is all yours. You can speak now. 
Thank you. So hello from my side. Um, my name is, as Serena mentioned, uh, Benjamin Sokolowski. Um, I'm transformation specialist slash product manager at the digitalization and technology unit in Wintersaldea. Um, they're responsible for self-service as well as uh, the digital worker topic we are um, driving forward for our organization. Um, by background, I started um, almost 15 years ago with Wintersaldea and on the production side, you can see behind me, and it's the only German operated production island Mittelplatte. And we're producing there on a daily base oil. And there my main task was um, CMS engineer. But besides that, I had also um, partly job as, as IT um, support and also driving digitalization projects there as well as, as other projects. So it was a huge variety of, of tasks I had there. Um, my topic of today is um, taking the opportunity to transform your processes and be brave to change. So, but why? I would like to, to tell you something about this. So um, one of our core values, our core company values is we are brave. So what does this mean? Um, we are empowered to, to change things, whether it's processes or policies or the way we work. And besides that, we, we try to transform our organization into a more agile organization so that we think more in an agile way, we value the way of agile working and also the core values which comes with agile working. And Therefore, we also try to improve um, our internal processes from the team as well as the external, uh, as the overall processes for the company. Um, sorry, one second. Um, so basically, um, when it starts to change processes, you don't do it just for your own. You want to, to change processes for your company, but um, to change your mind, to really become a changer, to change your processes itself, um, you have to start small. So on a daily basis, you can start thinking about what are you doing there? So, and really evaluate on each topic you're working on. Is this really necessary or can I do less? So, and then I will come to that in one of my examples. Um, you can do less and see what happens. And um, besides that, it's um, the how. How do we do things in that manner? So it's not just what we are doing, but how we're doing. Is it valuable um, to create paper after paper after paper just to, to have it somewhere stored uh, who's no one look and no one looks after? Or is it more valuable to have a common data source for everyone? and also available for everyone. Um, one thing is, is really stop things that are not necessary in that case, if you really want to improve your processes and not just identifying things that may are not really necessary. There you can uh, apply many different methods um, to really optimize everything like the 80-20 rule, uh, the Pomodoro to, to make it more time boxed and efficient. And there's, there are many other methods you can use to really improve your daily work in a process manner. And then you will gain your toolbox to really get into this change process also from your mindset. What helped me out uh, back in time was starting with Agile working in an Agile team when we um, come back two and a half years and where we started our first digital twin journey. So we had this Agile setup uh, with, with several um, Agile teams and we really had good progress on the project. We really were able to have lean processes um, delivering in short period of time, um, products that could be used 
And why this helped me to change my mindset was because we had a focus, a focus on one delivery, not having 10 uh, projects on my list, just one. Focus, dedicated time to it. Um, another thing is that I'm not just work for my own. So I worked for the end users in the end because working agile means you have a very user-centric approach of product development. Um, and you will also gain a lot of feedback. Sometimes you will not like the feedback, but the feedback is still valuable and you can improve whether it's from the teamwork perspective or for your product. Another thing is that agile setups usually bring pressure on one hand, but you have usually a great environment with great people um, they are all dedicated to this project and where you can, can influence um, everyone and can be influenced and you can learn from each, each and every one. And you will gain a great team spirit throughout this. So we had back in time then team events dedicated for, for the specific group, but also for the overall setup so which was very valuable for this work. So, and why is it now worth to change your mindset? You're getting rid of things you don't need and others as well. Uh, you can improve your productivity or efficiency throughout this because you're just getting rid of things that are maybe repetitive, but not needed. And um, you can increase your, your quality because you have more focus on the task you do and the dedicated time. And besides that, you, you will become a way better team player. So you will get into the position to, to increase also your, I don't like to, to, to name it that way, but your soft skills. So basically what, what comes not with your educational or technical background. Um, so now let's let's start with, with some examples. Um, I, I mentioned it in, in the invitation as low-hanging fruits. I, I will start with an easy one and then we'll get a little bit, let's, let's call it, in the more difficult area. So um, first of all, um, one, one thing I was also part of uh, when I worked for, for the production side was uh, basically production reporting. I was a stand-in and did this several times. And what we recognized is it's a huge amount of paper we try to move, um, but does this really was valuable for everyone who gets any, uh, any kind of report? So, and what did we try? Just pretty simple. Those out of 20, 35, no matter reports, we picked us those we thought no one reads this and no one needs this. So we just didn't send them out anymore. No one notices. it. And the great thing is after doing this with, with some more reports, even some come, come back, yeah, yeah, I didn't get this report, but I get this report and I don't need this one because I'm almost working in, in a totally different area. So we could also um, decrease the amount of recipients for these reports. And this saves huge of time. So we could, uh, for all the reporting tasks, we could split the time basically because we didn't have to send everything out and, and checking the, the mail stuff and, and so on. So it was very great to just being brave and just didn't send something out. The second thing of this is you go then one step further. You will not send any report, but you will share a common data, data source. And this would be great if you do this for your whole organization because production numbers are reported by, by your board or whatever. So there's no really secret to it. 
So you can, can share this numbers public. Maybe you create a nice dashboard for it so everyone can understand the data and that's it. So sharing data, creating transparency are things that helps you to change processes because um, you foster the transparency and also understanding why these processes are not needed anymore. Coming, coming to my next example, I had this discussion with our legal department um, and they have this, I don't want to like name it issue, but um, they get many requests for um, NDA forms. And while explaining the process to me, um, it was quite clear that they waste, oh, not waste, but spending a lot of time to really provide the information, the requests that needed, but they have to, to ask a lot of questions. So, and the first idea was, ah, hey, let's do a chatbot. But the chatbot would reduce just effort on one end of the process. So therefore, um, I propo uh, proposed, let's do an app because if the questions are clear and the outcome is clear, you can define it in an app, in an app and just have to show the requester where it is. So in the end, you have on one side, legal, no effort anymore. On the other side, the requester that doesn't have to, to ask for an NDA and gets replied, okay, what exactly do you need? Can you ask, uh, answer these questions and so on? Just seeing the questions live in the app, choosing the right answers, and then getting a direct link or a direct access to a form. So uh, building such a prototype is also quite easy nowadays because there are a lot of platforms, uh, low code, no code based, um, where you can just um, simply build apps by drag and drop. So there's also no effort really needed. Took, I think, two, two hours to, to build a prototype for that. And that's it. So, but over the year, we spent a lot of NDAs to, to our pilots and, and testing out and start collaborating with other companies. And for each and every company, we need, need an NDA. So what could be simpler as, as doing here the optimization with an app instead of having lots of writing, phoning and whatever. I thought long, long about this because many people get tired about the overall discussion on COVID. Um, but in the end, COVID was, was a huge enabler for a variety of technologies. And we even uh, were faced by request towards remote support and also now popping up virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on. And we're just starting it right now, but this will be also a big change for people, whether they are in the office and supporting, or they are on site um, doing doing the actual um, work and also inspection with with some some handhelds, headsets, whatever, and also for third parties, because um, back in time when we had um, the civil war in Libya, we also did their video inspection, also with with respective bodies that gave us certification via visual inspection throughout remote support tools. And uh, besides that, I mean, everyone has seen the robots um, walking around uh, in France or whatever and, and having their job for, for the COVID routines. So I think this is one of change or starting points for change which you cannot influence, but you have to react. To react. You, have, you have to react also quite quickly. And this is also something you can't do if you really have your old structures and old processes that are slowing you down. Um, in my last example, I want to shortly talk to you about 
a very ENP specific topic. Um, it's the OSDU. OSDU stands for Open Subsurface Data Universe. And it's um, kind of unique because it's the first open uh, data platform for the EMP business. And um, it's not, not just any, any kind of uh, digital twin platform. It's really meant for having your data in there, processing your data in there, and also um, standardized. So it means that this will be effort for every company who wants to onboard, for sure. But um, every every service company, every um, even even a private person could build um, some applications for that. So, and with this, you have a huge market for um, companies who want to sell software products. And on the other hand, of course, customers who can use and also share um, insights and feedback throughout the platform. And I think this is also a big game changer in that area. And I know also that um, the German Fraunhofer Institute did something for, for um, manufacturer of pumps and machines and so on. So um, this will, this will um, be a huge impact on, on the industry overall. I mentioned uh, earlier the collaboration in, in agile teams. And um, this is also where I want to talk a little bit around partnership. Um, on, the one, on one hand, of course, we, we always uh, look on internal partnerships as it is our um, production sites um, where really the end users are um, with the specialized teams for, for um, global production um, or global engineering or uh, integrated reservoir management or whatever. And also looking, of course, for external partners. And um, the external partners actually can, can be um, a variety of things, for sure. Uh, this can be service provider or software provider, but um, it can also be just, let's call it, consultants with a specific background. And um, the benefit out of it is they have a customer base. So we are just working for us. They're working with, with a lot of other customers. So gaining more insight also on, on mistakes made and also um, on lessons learned and, and what went well. And they can convey it to, to other customers. And on the other hand, we have also the um, consultants, um, especially when, when they work in, in the area of for example, Agile, um, or user experience. And this is also very valuable to have such guys on board if you go to product development, because they know the methods, they know the tools. You, you for sure can learn these tools, but it takes time, many time. And usually you don't have this time if you work in an Agile setup, because you have, you have your um, sprint cycle, and usually you have to, to deliver every two to four weeks uh, at least an increment, so part of a final product, which is which is testable, actually, and there you cannot every time go back and uh, reinvent how you want to interact with your users. So um, implementing them in your product lifecycle is very valuable. And um, just one method I would like to highlight right now is um, the persona. And the persona is, is maybe. Um, your set card of a specific end user. So you try to understand your end user and, and try to, to figure out what um, drives him forward, what holds him back, maybe also something about this private background. So because um, especially when you go on site, there is a way of the, um, interaction with, with the environment than we have it in a, in a bigger city, um, especially also uh, with respect to NGOs, and um, that's very valuable for your product development to really um, know who's your customer. So with respect to time, I, I promise to just do 20 minutes. 
and I'm over now. Um, maybe now it's up to you. I think the opportunities are there everywhere, on every desk, um, on every workbench, or maybe also already in your private toolbox. Um, it takes braveness to get out of your comfort zone, to really try to change first in small steps, your private workplace, but then if you have your learnings and also um, your mistakes you made, um, where you can learn a lot of, and then you can move on and can change even more. So um, last but not least, I would like to um, motivate you to share, whether it's mistakes or successes within your organization, but also with external, maybe with your network, which you should build, of course, because the world is getting smaller these days, especially in our industries. So thanks for your attention. I would like to maybe get one or two questions. I didn't check yet, but it doesn't look like that we have a question right now. <clears throat> okay, so hi, uh, Benjamin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I have a question for you. How a good uh, partner network influence the transformations? A well, good, good partner network uh, really drives the transformation process there. So because um, if you're quite new to this um, transformation business, um, you don't know where to start. So and really um, your network and also a specific partners really can, can help you work your roadmap so that you really have a specific plan where you want to be in this year or maybe in five years. So there, there's the experience given from outside in this case. Um, we, we now have some, some uh, experience inside, but, but if you're new to this change, then it's very valuable to have, to have a reliable network. Okay. So thank you so much for answering my question. And thank you so much for your perceptive presentation. And I have enjoyed listening to uh, your talk. And... Uh, I'll ask the audience that if someone will be having any question, they can ask you in the Q session or in the chat session. Okay. Thank you so much for being here and adding value in our conference. Thanks for inviting me. And <laughs> if I don't hear anything, I wish you all happy holidays already. <laughs> wish you same. Thank you. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, hope you have enjoyed the uh, uh, talk of uh, Benjamin. And now our next presenter is Ivan Branko, and uh, he is with us. Hi, Ivan. How are you? Hello. Good afternoon. I'm doing well. Good afternoon. Hope the same for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm good too. Thank you for asking. Okay, so Ivan, thank you so much for being here and uh, joining us as a keynote speaker. It's good to have you and uh, I'll introduce you and then you can start your presentation, okay? No problem. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now with us is Ivan Abranko, uh, who is the head of portfolio at E2E Processes uh, at Volvo Group and originally from Portugal. And Ivan is an active and passionate professional in the area of data and uh, today responsible for governing the IT uh, project portfolio and budget plus E2E processes uh, with focus on the deployment of the data journey to make Volvo Group future-proof uh, organization. So um, Ivan, you can uh, start your presentation now after okay. sharing your screen. Yes, I will share and say some visual aids. I hope you just let me know once you can see it. Sure. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it now. Very good. So I will start. Um, what I'm bringing to you today, uh, more than, let's say, any type of tools or techniques, 
is more, uh, let's say, an historical background and also experience from what our company has, has gone through when it comes to, um, let's say, implementing automation or utilizing automation to complement and optimize our operational processes. And the reason why I take this approach, first of all, is because we only have 30 minutes and uh, I'm not in the selling mode, it's more on sharing experience. And because whenever we talk about automation, uh, it is related, let's say, to our workforce and it has a big impact on the perception or the willingness, the buy-in, let's say, from, from the employees uh, when we, are, we start talking about these principles. So that's what I will try to share with you today. And um, I would be, of course, interested to hear your questions and your own personal experiences to contribute, let's say, for our further uh, growth. So when we talk about automation, uh, people normally think about, let's say, future technology. They think about something that is very disruptive and very, very new. But uh, actually, automation has been around for quite, uh, quite a while. It has just recently become more and more of, let's say, of a, of a buzzword. But when we think about what, what automation is about, just purely talking about applying uh, technical solutions to reduce human impact. And we've been doing that for, for quite some, some time now. So uh, it's not something new. It's not something, let's say, uh, surprising. It's something we've been uh, working with for, for quite a while. And sometimes when it's done in the correct way, it's actually seamless. And we don't actually reflect so much about it. Even if we think about our day-to-day, -day, I mean, many of the solutions that we are using, I mean, yeah, we just forget that this is about optimizing um, processes that have existed for a while and trying to reduce as much the human um, factor into it. But you will never fully remove the human factor into it. And that's the perspective that we have to, to, to bring when we are communicating with our employees and when we are trying to optimize our processes through automation. So... To start with, what is automation about? It is about the use or introduction of automatic equipment in the manufacturing or other process or facility. That is the definition that the Oxford Disc Dictionary gives of automation. But then, like I mentioned before, it has already existed for quite some time. Uh, if we look at, the, at history, I mean, the printing press was an example of automation. Uh, in 1589, we had the automated knitting machine. So we had very many different examples throughout the different centuries of how we have been using, how we have utilized automation to really optimize how we work. And the goal has never been to uh, remove the employee. In some cases, maybe that's arguable, but most of it was not about removing the employees, but it was about being able to focus on the important things, being able to focus on value creation being able to focus on creativity. And that's what I will, I will try to explain because within uh, our company, we have in the latest years been very much focusing on how can we, yeah, how can we use optimization in a positive way with some positive insight? How can it be perceived as something that is helping us and not something that is there to remove work away from people? Um, hopefully I'll be able to answer those questions for you. So when we talk about automation, I mean, historically, people have always reacted to automation by asking themselves if it, if it would replace them or what would happen to them. Uh, uh, how would they be able to continue? Uh, would they be out of jobs? How would they be affected by the changes in their social and professional reality? And like I said before, in, in some cases that happens. That was a correct statement. There was and there is an impact coming from automation, but this is this is due to uh, how we are using automation. So if we think about history again, we've had some many movements that have uh, rejected and, and tried to fight against automation. The Luddite movement was one of the first movements to fight against automation and innovation. Today, we use actually the term Luddite to describe people who dislike new technologies or are uh, resistant, let's say, to, uh, to such things as automation. But uh, its origins uh, of this uh, Luddite term, they date back to an early 19th century uh, labor movement that rallied against the ways that mechanized manufacturers uh, and their unskilled laborers uh, undermined the skilled craftsmen of the day. So we were taking away from uh, the experience, the, the craftsmanship 
of people and really focusing on simplifying the processes. So like I mentioned before, automation has not always been a positive thing. In, in many occasions, it has been used as an instrument to um, remove people, to improve or increase profits. Also, during the Great Depression, uh, as people bought more and more products like auto automobiles, radios, uh, different appliances, and even began out to, 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 to go out and see movies and, and really go into a, cap a capitalistic approach, um, there was also resistance. And these new automated mass production lines made creating products much faster and easier. And this had an impact on empl employment rates and, and thus on the purchasing power, leading to economical unbalance. And this resulted into the Great Depression. Not the only reason, but one of the many reasons that contributed to the economical depression. And then there is also the Triple Revolution Memorandum. So it's a, a document stating the three revolutions that were underway in the world at that moment, which included also the cyber nation revolution with the increase of automation, with the claim that machines would usher in a system of almost unlimited pro productive uh, capacity while continually reducing the number of manual laborers. So all of that contributes to the fear because history is showing to us and showing to the employees clear examples of how this was done or has been done in a not so positive way. And it is our role within our companies to show that automation can be taken or can be used in a different way. That is our responsibility. So when we look at the possibilities that are open by automation, we can see that uh, it is expected or it was expected by 2020, uh, 2018, sorry, by Gartner, that automation would make 1.8 million jobs redundant. You can see as well that in our society, people are worried about increased automation in the workplace. What does that mean for me? They're worried about losing their jobs because of automation. And they also understand that this will cause a displacement if we talk about manufacturing um, of jobs and facilities by 2030. So these are certain examples of where we already see um, an impact of automation into society. Then let's go to the beginning again, not in history, but on the basic principle of why we should use automation. And let's try to then take it to a positive place. Let's try to understand how we can use it to add value, creating an understandment, uh, understanding, sorry, and also an engagement from the employees where we can actually extract value from automation. That is what we have tried to do within our company. So the first understanding is that the reason why we should use automation is to replace mechanistic thinking. What I mean is that those repetitive actions that we have to do on a daily basis, that should be the focus of what we want to replace. But on the other hand, we should invest in the critical thinking. We should invest into the creativity, into the core thinking as well. We should give more time for people to focus on things that can give them satisfaction, where they can feel that they are part of the strategy and the outcome of the company, where they're helping us build a vision and not just simply performing or doing repetitive actions. And if we look at how the world has been developing, it is true that we are seeing that people are more engaged into service-like activities and less on manufacturing activities. If we look at the manufacturing line of today and the number of people that are engaged into manufacturing, and if we look at just a few years back, um, the approach has been changing. And automation is a facilitator, is an enabler to do this. So if we're able to show people that positive side, I think that the employees will be a lot more engaged. And by that, connecting it to process management, to uh, process optimization, um, we will be able to do things quicker and better, more efficiently. So that's the type of message that we're trying to, to share with people. That yeah, on one side, you have the robots performing those repetitive actions. On the other side, you have the humans focusing on creativity, on creating new solutions, on creating new products, on creating new visions. That's the approach that we've been trying to take.
Also because this takes us to the paradox of automation. I mean, the man needs the machine, but the machine also needs the man. Um, it is true, we will have less people, less humans involved in the actual process, but their involvement will be critical to the stability and outcome of the process. You'll need to secure the knowledge behind how the process was designed and created, and you'll need to secure the continuous execution of that process. And that cannot be done by the automatic process itself. Otherwise, the error will continuously reproduce until you go into a manual mode and someone needs to be there to correct the problem and its consequences. So going back again, man needs machine. Machine also needs man. Plus, many of the surrounding processes to an auto automated process are limited in possibilities of being automated as well, as they require human level pattern recognition, language comprehension and language production abilities, which machines are not able to do. So we will again need man to be involved. And then there's also cost. In many cases, it is less costly to have certain activities performed by humans than machines. And that understanding, that critical thinking is supposed to be there by our employees. The understanding that, yes, okay, we have on one side machines, but yes, we also have humans and we also have this, this creativity, this value adding work that needs to be done. And we have, of course, the profit discussions. And it is a balance between all of these things that will uh, get us to the right point of usage of automation. But still, uh, what we need to retain is that automation is not here to replace us, but to assist us, assist us in evolving assist us in being able to move forward as we have been doing for so many years now. And we, we, we need to think as well about our daily lives and how we, we are actually already having technology as part of everything that we do. I mean, we have our smartphones, we have our laptops, we have our tablets, we have even in our vehicles, the level of integration and of automation in modern society is quite big. But to a certain extent, it is seamless in the sense that we do not reflect or think about it. So when we are going into a manufacturing process, that same thinking has to be pre present. It is about simplifying things to make it seamless but present. And by that, to add value to the employee and by default to the company itself. So these are some reflections that we went through. Uh, and then we focused, okay when using automation, then maybe our approach should be on how can we build solutions that the employees love? And here, we also had to have a shift, a shift in our way of thinking. You know, for many years, uh, in the way that we were developing our solutions, we were thinking top down, or let's say we would receive some business requirements. Those business requirements would be massaged by different departments, by different people, by different functions until they would get to, um, to our IT. And then IT would have to translate those business requirements into technical requirements. And a lot of things got lost in, in translation. So how can we optimize that? How can we simplify? How can we make it more efficient? And how can we make it quicker? That's what got us, got us thinking. And of course, we have different frameworks and methodologies and how we can integrate the business together with IT to simplify that translation of information. But we went beyond that. How can we build solutions that employees love? What can make them love a solution? And that's where we started to think, okay, maybe yeah, there is a different way of thinking, a different way of doing where these dependencies between different departments, these silos can be broken down and we can actually add value by doing things in a different way. So going from, let's say, a, a vertical or, or an horizontal, sorry, an horizontal way of thinking to a vertical way of thinking, how could we do that? So then we started to think, who can add value? Who can make sure that whichever solution we're building is purpose-built, it's easy to use, it's part of the process, it is in many cases end to end, where we have this mindset of push instead of pull, that it is versatile and that it is engaging. And finally, that it is collaborative. And the answer was right in front of us. It's the employee. 
the ones that can make sure that we are creating a solution that they love are the employees. So why not make them part of the development of these automation solutions? So it is normal that when taking this approach, that initially the employees will say, okay, but you're adding work to us. You're giving us more responsibility. No, by using this approach that we, it's called in the industry citizen development, by allocating the responsibilities of the development to the employees using, let's say, uh, non-IT trained employees to become software developing uh, developers using, let's say, IT approved low code or no code solutions. Um, we felt that whatever we would be delivering would be closer to what they actually need because that would be their focus. It would not be an interpretation for someone who has not performed that work, but it would be a practical application of uh, the knowledge on the needs that they have instantly. And by that, ensuring that the solutions we're delivering are a lot closer to, uh, to what the needs are. Like I said, I'm not going through the technique, the methods during this session, because that would take a lot of time. Of course, we had to review on how we are working with IT. And this is not applicable for all the solutions that we have within our business, but to a great extent, it is applicable. Uh, but it does require that we use data differently as well. Uh, how do we access information to be able to construct these solutions? And also it will result in um, an increase on the number of solutions. And of course, you need to have the governance structures connected to that. But the end result is that the engagement of our employees has increased because they can see that they are the masters of their process and that they can build the solutions that will assist them with those specific processes. And then when it comes to IT, it's not like we're removing IT completely because they have the experience that can assist then our citizen developers in the work that they need to perform. So it became simpler in the communication as well. They are working a lot closer to, to the business using some other frameworks that we have in the industry. Uh, and by combining all of this together, we can see that we are a lot quicker in providing also to our customers the products that they need. So when we look at the citizen development, it's not really a role, it's not a title. It's more about having this kind of full enterprise-wide automation and creating a dynamic environment. That's how we saw it, and that's how we, we developed it as well. Also, we are currently in a new era when it comes to, um, to automation with many different solutions available. Uh, and it is about being able to use these uh, solutions to add value. So uh, we call this as a, a new era. It's, it is an evolution or revolution when it comes to how we have worked with automation in the past. It's a lot easier and a lot quicker to be able to, to develop these uh, these solutions um, and the integration of these different principles. So, so here, when I'm showing this slide, it's a lot of things that we are using within, within our company. Actually, all of them are being used right now within our company to be able to, to um, facilitate this journey of transformation that we're going upon. So then this means that the employee's profile is also going to be different. Um, and when we are talking about having a different profile, again, this can be misinterpreted. Interpreted. People might think that we're talking about getting rid of the current workforce and then focusing on, on a new workforce. But no, there's different ways of doing that. And this is also something that we've been engaged in. So of course, we first have upskilling. So taking our current workforce and educate them on the new principles. Then it can be that through automation, certain of the existing rules will be made uh, redundant. Then we talk about reskilling. So taking people and, and together with them, agreeing on, hey, what is your personal interest? How can we then use your skills and transform those skills to a new role that you are supposed to have? Because that role might have become redundant through the automation process. It is, of course, as well about recruiting. In some cases, those certain parts of the skills are not easily just uh, 
we learned, but that should be, let's say, an ultimate scenario. And it is, in some cases, about buying. Um, when we go into these transformation journeys, there are a few companies that have a lot of experience. And then, of course, we should use that experience to accelerate this transformation journey. Also, very important to mention is that this, these principles have to be integrated into the corporate identity, into its values, culture, principles, and of course, processes, because the processes are at the core of why we are going in this direction. So it needs to be embedded on corporate strategy. It needs to be aligned with your IT organization or, or services. And it has to meet the clear expectations from the workforce. So the dialogue is essential. So when we look at all of this, uh, automation is a great enabler. It's a great possibility to become better. And it's very simple if we look at the tools that we have available today. And by this, we are making sure that the employees are fully engaged. We're making sure that our processes are being optimized to the fullest by those who are affected by them. And uh, we can just summarize that uh, this is just the beginning. So I don't know if there are any questions, but this is what I had to share with you today regarding our experiences within, uh, within our company when it comes to this specific area. Uh, and I hope uh, it has been uh, an interesting topic for you. But like I said, here keeping it very high level, but sharing mostly the experience that we have had in this area without going too much into the technicalities, because that would take us uh, too much time. Hi, Ivan. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and it was really very interesting session and uh, uh, thank you so much for being here and adding value in our conference and I hope everyone have enjoyed your, uh, listening to your talk and uh, I'll ask them that if they have any question they can ask you in the chat or in the QA session. Very good. Okay, okay. so uh, thank you so much for joining us and happy holidays. Have a great Likewise. day. Likewise. Happy holidays to, to everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, now uh, at, we are at the end of our conference. So this has been a wonderful conference. I have enjoyed listening to the talks uh, from our valued keynote speaker. It is a privilege and honor to be entrusted with such an undertaking at a gathering of such eminent people from different parts of the world. So thank you so much to our esteemed presenters for their valuable point of view. Now we are reached at the end of our conference and uh, uh, on behalf of Platinum Global Solution, I would like to thank all the stakeholders, including speakers, delegates, and sponsors, without whom this conference would not have been possible. I extend my best wishes to all of you and we will be back with novel themes in the coming months in the field of BPO and um, Share Services Excellence. And uh, happy holidays. Have a nice day. Stay safe.